Chapter One of Roman Color Detective. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Therese. Roman Color Detective by Grace and Harold Johnson. Chapter One. Father Timothy Devon assistant at St. Mary's Parish, sat on the edge of his bed while he changed into an old pair of trousers and a white t-shirt. He stood up, gave a final tug to his belt, and walked the three steps around the foot of his bed to the only window in the small room. Squinting his large brown eyes, he looked into the low, mid-August sun, which had turned the schoolhouse windows into sheets of gold. There was a glint, too, on the short brown grass on the ball field beyond the playground. Grass turned crisp and ready to fade with the first touch of frost. Three more weeks, and school would start. Then the yard would be full of shouting, laughing children, happy at their games, under the watchful eyes of the sisters, who were now away at their mother house for the summer. A smile flicked across his generous mouth, as the picture formed in his mind. But tonight, other activity would be taking place in the yard. Men and women would be there in place of children, and they'd be busy erecting booths for St. Mary's Summer Festival. Father Tim turned away from the window at the sound of a heavy tread on the stairs, followed by a brief interval of quiet, and then another thud. The uneven clumping sound of legs not putting the same amount of force into each step. His eyes softened. Bill shouldn't be climbing those steps with that game leg of his. He should have remained downstairs. Surely Miss Kearney would have told him to wait in the reception room. That was the trouble with Bill. He never waited for anything or anyone. Act first, and then think. That was Bill every time. Maybe that was why he'd never talked about the machine-gun wounds he got in his right leg in Korea. Probably he had made some impetuous move to help one of his men, disregarding his own safety. That would be like him. Even at home when they were kids together, Bill was forever getting into trouble because he never thought things out first. Home. What a beehive that had been, with all the action and all the sweetness. The nine of them, seven girls, and then himself and Bill, had made it that way. Dad and Mom must have given up all hope of having boys after Dorothy, the seventh girl, had been born. But maybe they hadn't wanted any boys. Maybe they'd just as soon had more girls. And then to get two boys so unalike that no one would take them for brothers. Bill, heavy-set, athletic, not more than five ten, with black wavy hair and black eyes, and a temper, too. And himself, tall, skinny, never much for sports, hair like a torch, and a face blotched with freckles. Nobody had to tell him he was slow going. Even Aunt Martha had needled him about how long it took him to say Mass, but he reminded her gently that Christ had hung on the cross for three hours. From outside in the hall came the heavy tread, followed now by a long scraping sound, a few more thumps, then fingertips tapping at the door. Come in, Bill. The door opened, and Bill Devon entered the room. How'd you know it was me, Tim? You sound like a peg leg sailor when you walk upstairs. Bill gave him a worried frown. That bad? Maybe not quite, but you know you shouldn't be doing stairs. You should have waited. I was coming down right away. Bill grinned. I suppose you're right. Doc said the leg's coming along swell, but not to make it do too many bends. But you know me, Tim. I'm no good at waiting. Never have been. And I can't say, as that dreary room downstairs is much to wait in. I spent a half hour there yesterday when you were out, with old eagle eyes peeking in every two minutes to make sure I hadn't run off with that moth-eaten Davenport. You hadn't better let Miss Kearney hear you call it moth-eaten. She'll skin you. Yeah. Anyhow, I wanted to see what kind of quarters you rate. Bill looked around the small room at the single iron bed, the leather armchair with an adjustable lamp at the side, and the small desk with the crucifix hanging on the wall above it. Tim gave him a wry smile. Hardly worth the climb, is it? Such luxury. I thought you'd rate only a chair and a bed, but a desk, too. Why, there's a desk in your office downstairs. Where'd you scrounge this one? Does Father Kearney know you've got it? Father Tim laughed. I inherited it from my predecessor. If he scrounged it, I'm glad he did. I certainly need it. What for? My work. This isn't a bedroom. This is an office with a bed in it. I do more work up here than I do downstairs. 
Here's where I do my homework, penance for any idle moments during the day. I had as good quarters as this in Korea. You were a captain, me. I'm only an assistant, but I do have a wonderful view. You couldn't equal that in Korea. Father Tim stepped to the window and held back the immaculate white ruffled curtains. What do you think of it? Bill limped across the room to the window. St. Mary's lay on the western edge of Galton, Ohio, and commanded a view of most of the town. Beyond the church and school grounds, the hill dropped gradually through a curtain of trees to Willow Creek, which cut the town in two. Looking to the right, a mile and a half away, within the bend of the creek, Bill saw the town's two factories with their tall stacks. Above them on higher ground stretched Main Street, its stores and offices, while on the sloping hills on both sides of the creek were the homes, their television antenna making excellent perches for the birds. To the left on the rolling hillsides lay green farmlands and pastures, with barns and houses here and there. French on the distant hills were trees to frame the picture. Not bad, Tim, not bad, Bill said. In fact, you've got a million-dollar view from a three-dollar room. Father Tim turned, placed his hand on his brother's shoulder. Shall we go? Okay. As they started for the door, Bill stopped and looked at his brother. You're not going out in those clothes. Don't tell me you're one of the work crew. A gentle smile flitted across the priest's face. It feels good to get into old clothes like these once in a while. You know I've only worn a Roman collar for thirteen months. I might ask, why aren't you in uniform? You've been at Aunt Martha's three days, and as soon as you arrived, you got into civilian clothes. How come? Self-defense, I guess, Bill laughed. Everywhere I go in uniform, some character corners me. Look, Captain, I was in World War I or two, And then for the next hour I get a blow-by-blow -blow account of how that hero won the war. I see your point. From outside came the sound of cars sliding to a stop in the schoolyard, car doors slamming and a mumble of mixed voices. When they reached the first floor, Father Tim said, Wait here a minute. I want to get a hammer out of the kitchen utility drawer. After he rejoined his brother, they walked slowly through the back hall and went out the side door. This will be a busy night, getting things set up for the festival. It's Father Kearney's one money raiser of the year, and it takes a lot of money to keep the school going. Of course the festival doesn't raise what we need to run the school, but every bit helps. I suppose there are lots of headaches connected with it. I wouldn't say that, but of course there's always something that goes wrong. We usually weather it, though. Father Kearney's got a bunch of good workers, men and women, and they make the whole thing possible. It's the same old faithfuls each year, and they know where everything is stored and just where it belongs. Then what are you doing in the work outfit? Stick around and you'll see, and don't let my costume worry you. No one will pay attention to it, but you should see the kids' eyes pop when they see Father Kearney in work clothes. They walked through the garden to the schoolyard. Nice place here, Tim. Where do they set up the booths? On the other side of the school, that level piece of ground the kids use as a ball field. From out of nowhere, an eleven-year-old boy appeared, walking beside Father Tim. Hi, Father! Father Tim looked down with surprise at the big blue eyes, the uncombed hair, and the scrawny arms sticking out from a faded green t-shirt, on the front of which was lettered, St. Mary's. Hello there, Muscles. Where'd you come from? I was here all the time, Father. So I see. Muscles, I want you to meet my brother, Bill, a captain in the Army. Bill, this is John Patrick O'Rourke. Muscles to everyone. You fly the jets? Bill laughed. No, Muscles, I'm just in the infantry. Oh. Father Tim rubbed his hands into Muscles' hair. Muscles hasn't decided yet whether he wants to fly the jets or become a priest. I can see why you'd go for the jets, Bill said. Most kids do. But what makes you think you want to be a priest? For a minute, Muscles scuffed the ground, towing up the dust in silence. I'd like to be like Father Tim when I grow up. Father Tim's hand pressed down gently on the boy's head. Muscles is my right-hand man. Whenever I need an altar boy in a hurry, I can depend on him, and he's always on time, too. Aren't you, Muscles? Yes, Father. He's right end on my football team. A little bit light, but in there fighting all the time. Bill raised his eyebrows. Your football team? 
Yes, I coach our grade school team in the county parochial league. You what? Father Tim shot a cool glance at Bill. Remember that desk in my room? I mentioned my homework. There are books on every subject, and I can read. Bill laughed. I get it now. Father, Muscle said, Mr. Linton says someone stole some of the pipe he made to stand from. He said he had it all bundled up when he put it away last year, and the bundle was open when he went to get it. He said to ask you if you know where it is. Father Tim grinned. Does he think I stole it? Oh, no, Father. I'm sure he doesn't, but he just thinks you might know about it. How about it, Father? Did you scrounge some pipe? Bill asked. Father Tim shrugged his shoulders. I haven't the slightest idea what became of it. Most of the stuff is stored in a room in the school basement. I'll have to find Linton and see what's missing. If you don't mind, Tim, I'll sit over there on that packing case and wait for you. Give my leg a rest. Sure thing. I won't be long. I know you've got a lot to do, so don't worry about me. I'll watch and put up your circus for a while, and if you don't find me around when you return, you'll know I went back to Aunt Martha's to listen to the ball game. Cleveland's playing New York tonight. Okay? Fine, Bill. The young priests and muscles walked across the field to where John Linton and two other men were standing beside a pile of steel pipe. Almost in unison, the three men said, Good evening, Father. After acknowledging their greeting, Father Tim nodded toward muscles. My informer here tells me some of your pipe is missing. Linton, a short, heavy-set man, gray-haired, went into a detailed account of how he had tied the pipes and put them away after last year's festival. And now two twelve-foot lengths are gone. There was a ninety-degree elbow at the end of each pipe. Two elbows are missing, but two had been taken off and put back on the pile. Linton lighted a cigarette and looked at Father Tim. Know anything about it, Father? No, I don't. I wonder. Linton laughed and cut in. I've been wondering, too. How about Dutton, the custodian? We can ask him. He's over there helping with the Sodality Girls' booth. When the question was put to him, Dutton looked uneasily from Linton to Father Tim. It's like this, Father. You remember last spring you said there should be a drinking fountain out in the schoolyard for the youngsters? I said if you'd get me the stuff, I'd put it in, remember? Father Tim nodded. Well, all you got me was the fountain bracket to fasten onto the school wall. Linton laughed. You believe in miracles, don't you, Father? Certainly. You've got one right here, a fountain with no connecting pipe, giving water. Right, Dutton? The custodian looked from Linton to Father Tim. I needed more than just the bracket, Father, and I remembered about the pipe in the basement. I'm sorry, Mr. Linton, that I took your pipe. That's all right, Dutton, Linton said. I use the fountain every morning after seven o'clock mass and I imagine the kids use it plenty during the school days. I'll get myself some more pipe. End of chapter one. Chapter two of Roman Collar Detective by Grace and Harold Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter two. Throughout the early evening, the day's heat continued to radiate from the ground. Father Kearney felt it as he walked through his garden toward the school grounds. He stopped to admire his flowers now at their best. A bit of rain would do them good, he thought. Then, as he heard the hammering and voices from the schoolyard, a gentle smile formed on his lips. Here he was wanting rain for his garden, and two days without rain for the festival at the same time. The good Lord must be hard put to satisfy the desires of man. He took out a handkerchief and mopped his hot face, and pushed back his dark grizzled hair. Though not broad, his forehead was the broadest part of a long, thin face. His shoulders had a slight stoop, giving his six-foot frame a shorter appearance. After lingering a moment in his garden, although he was tired and warm, he stepped quickly across to the festival site. Here he walked smilingly among his parishioners with a nod and a greeting. A carp purring softly crept up behind him. He stepped aside. Try my best to run you down, Father, John Linton called. I'd like to see you after a bit when I deliver this pipe. Father Kearney smiled and nodded. I want to see you, too. He followed the Linton car until it stopped. Then he stood aside while Linton untied two lengths of pipe 
and handed it to the waiting helpers, who added these lengths to the framework of the Ultra Society booth. A canvas roof, canvas sides, two boards for a counter, a bit of bunting, and the stand would be complete. That does it, Linton said as he turned to Father Kearney. It doesn't take long to get the booth up once you get the frame. We had to replace the two lengths of pipe that Harry Dutton snitched. What's that? Linton told him how the pipe had been used for the water fountain. Father Kearney smiled. It was a case of Dutton robbing Peter to pay Paul. No real harm done. Linton nodded, took out a pack of cigarettes, and offered it to the priest. No thanks, John, not now. You should cut down on them, too. You're smoking too much. I know, Linton replied, lighting one. Sometimes I think I'm really going to cut down, and I do, for an hour or two, and then I get all steamed up about something down at the office, like that editorial on the reservoir I wrote for today's paper. Did you read it? Yes, I wanted to talk to you about it. Let's go where there's less noise. Side by side they followed the dusty path they had walked so many times before, toward the heavy screen of pines which marked the boundary between the church property and the Linton home. The smell of the pines hung heavily in the warm air. Linton broke the silence. What do you think of the editorial? Father Kearney frowned. Unless you are holding back some of your ammunition, you could be in for a libel suit. When you name names in an editorial as strong as that one, you may expect things to happen. That's what I want. Action. And I want it to our way of thinking. I only used one barrel. The other's still loaded. You held back some of the facts? Yes. Why? I believe that Ted Ford Wilson will be around to find out how much more I know, and when I tell him, he'll take the pressure off. Then the dam and reservoir will be built beyond Hart's Corners, where it should be built, and not down the earth. Linton swept his arm in a circle to include the parish land, sloping away toward Willow Creek. In the silence that followed, the two men could hear the birds in the trees settling down for the night. I took time yesterday, Linton continued, to drive to the courthouse in Crescent City and learn that all that low scrubland across the creek belongs to Wilson's son-in-law, Don Tomlinson. Of course that means Wilson put up the money and merely tried to cover up by having the property bought in Tomlinson's name. The deal was put through just last February. And you think Wilson will stop putting the pressure on now that you know he owns the land on the far side of the creek? I think so, Father. Father Kearney was silent for a moment. I wish I could agree with you, John, but I'm afraid I'll have to content myself with the lake down there below our poverty. It would probably look very nice. You going back on me, too? No, I'm only trying to reconcile myself to second best. I'm not going to allow the second best to happen if I can help it. I'm going to fight Wilson until he's licked. My paper does mold public opinion, and public opinion is hard to beat. A lot of people will have their say now that they know the land is no longer part of the old Manning estate. A blind man can see what Wilson is up to. Once the people have their eyes opened, they'll understand that there's conniving going on between Wilson and the commissioners. Yes, and no, John. People are very lethargic. They're hard to stir. Furthermore, a lot of people will admire Wilson's cupidity in buying up that land cheap and selling it at a high price, if he succeeds in doing that. Linton dropped his cigarette butt and ground it viciously with his toe. He'll not succeed if I can help it. Hart's Corners is where the reservoir belongs, geographically, economically, and for the sake of the future of Galton. That's all true, but Wilson is the political boss, and the commissioners will do as he says. Maybe, father, unless the people get so incensed that they stop it. I intend to see that they do. He paused a minute and looked out into the night. It's true, father, what you said about people admiring Wilson's cupidity. Some will, and that same group will use this as further proof that I'm a screwball, that I didn't want to cash in on what I own on this bank of the creek. But I can't see it. This local watershed isn't large enough to meet future demands, and there's no use in sinking a lot of the people's money into a reservoir here. Linton reached to light another cigarette, a warm smile moving in to crowd out the fighting expression which had previously been on his face. I've never said anything before to you, Father, about this, but I've always had in mind to make that strip of Baden land down there into a park area with outdoor stations of the cross. It was something my mother always talked about and something she wanted. Often when I was a boy and we walk along the creek, she'd point to some of those big glacial rocks and say, 
Now wouldn't that be a nice place for a little shrine for one of the Stations of the Cross? I'm going to fight to keep the creek and its banks the way it is, but either way it goes, the church gets the land. However, I'm not deeding that creek bank property over until this thing is settled. I don't want St. Mary's dragged into this reservoir site brawl. If the commissioners decide to go ahead as Wilson wants, then you'll get a check for what I get for the property. But if they build the dam at Hart's Corners, where it should be, you get the deed to the land on the side of the creek. Father Kearney was thoughtful for a moment. That's very generous of you, John. God will bless you, and I hope you beat the politicians and see your mother's wish fulfilled. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of Roman Collar Detective by Grace and Harold Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Three. Mary Jo Linton let her fingers run quickly through an arpeggio after playing the final chord of the Whiffenpoof song. It was fun to limber up her fingers, and it was satisfying, too, the way the melodies quickened her pulse or soothed her, depending on the tempo of the selection. She must spend a bit more time at the piano. Perhaps if she played more she would lose some of her restlessness. It was probably due to the letdown after her busy spring, proms, final exams, graduation from New Rochelle College, and the rush that Jerry Laughlin had given her the past two months. Her hands moved quickly into a minor chord, followed by a run in the same key. That's the way she felt, like the melancholy notes she was playing. Why did she feel this way? So restless. There was no reason for it. A gust of irritation swept through her. Why did Jerry have to run off to the wilds of Canada to fish during his vacation? He could just as well have stayed home and fished in some of the nearby lakes. Then they could have dated some in the afternoon and evenings. She stood up from the piano and moved slowly to the front hall, turned on the light, and looked at herself in the mirror above the hall table. She liked her dress. Its splashy crimson flowers on the yellow background went well with her black hair and eyes. It had been new for that house party at spring vacation. She smiled at the memory of a gay weekend. Half turned to the mirror, she gave it a quick side glance, slightly speculative, her eyes narrowing. Her lips formed a soft straight line. With a quick movement, she reached up and pinched her nose and pulled it down. Too stubby, cute when she was a kid, but not exactly right for a girl almost twenty-two, who had just that morning received her temporary teaching certificate in home economics. A troubled feeling ran through her. Would she be able to keep discipline in her classes? Was she too young-looking? Could she be stern enough to command respect? She pushed back her shoulders, pursed her lips in severity, and let out a trill of laughter. She'd have to do better than that. With a restless movement, she turned quickly from the mirror and walked out the front door and down the broad stone steps onto the lawn. It was peaceful there, but too quiet. In her mood, she needed activity. She stood for a moment listening to the tapping of a hammer on the other side of the grove of trees, which shut off any view of the church and school. Her eyes moved slowly around, trying to penetrate the darkness. As she walked across the wide lawn to the edge of the woodlot, ancient trees which stood in stately beauty flanking their large home. She had always loved these trees. As a child, this had been her favorite play spot. She felt the wild ferns brush her bare legs, and she smelled the cool fragrance which came to her when the ferns broke under her feet. It was too early for the moon to filter through the trees, to make lacy patterns against the sky. It was very dark. Somehow, even the trees had lost some of their magic for her. So she decided to go back to the house, put on fresh lipstick, and walk over to the school grounds. Mother and Dad ought to be ready to come home, she thought. When she turned, she was conscious of a grating noise. It was no ordinary sound of the night. Someone was among the trees watching her. She could feel the presence. She stopped, her whole figure contracted with the tenseness of terror. She listened, her heart pounding wildly in her throat. A car swished by on the highway, its noise covering all other sounds. She stood motionless, waiting. She looked out toward the highway, two hundred feet away, where another car roared on the way from Galton to Hart's Corners. Across the highway to the left was the McCarthy home, lights burning brightly in most of the downstairs rooms. To the left on the property adjoining their own, she could see lights in Mr. Stone's house. 
As she listened intently, the pounding of her pulse receded, and she moved quickly back toward her home. It may have been a rabbit scurrying through the trees, but it hadn't sounded like a rabbit. It had been more like the abrasive, uneven step of someone unaccustomed to walking in the dark. Distant hammering came to her again, giving her a feeling of others not too far away. She would go over there to the school grounds and ride home with her folks. She laughed softly to herself. Dad would take the car if only going a half block. When she reached the front steps, she saw a man walking up a long driveway toward her. He was carrying his straw hat in his hand. For a moment she thought it was her father, the same short, stocky build and heavy head of graying, curly hair. When he got closer to her, the light from the living room showed her that it was Samuel Blake, one of the county commissioners. "'Good evening, Mr. Blake.' "'That you, Mary Jo?' "'Yes.' "'I didn't know for sure, as it's kind of dark out here. Is your father at home?' "'Not just now, but he will be soon. He's over at the church helping put up booths for the summer festival. Won't you come in and wait for him? I'll go over and tell him you're here.' "'Thanks, Mary Jo. I'll do that.' After walking into the living room and making Mr. Blake comfortable, Mary Jo stepped into the powder room, did over her lips, and went quickly out the front door. When she reached the highway, she noticed a parked car. It must be Mr. Blake's, she thought. Funny he hadn't driven into their driveway. Maybe he wasn't planning to stay very long and didn't want to block the drive, in case someone wanted to enter. She walked along the edge of the highway. As she had such a short distance to go, she didn't feel it worthwhile to cross to the far side to be facing traffic. She would have cut right in on the school ball field as soon as she passed the pines, if it hadn't been for the poison ivy which she knew flanked the road. Living outside the city limits of Galton might have some advantages, she thought, but walking in open-toed pumps in the loose gravel at the side of the highway wasn't one of them. The light of the oncoming car picked out the figure of a man lipping towards her. Though he was in civilian clothes, she recognized him as the fellow she had seen in McCarthy's driveway two days before. Only then he had been in a captain's uniform. But why did he limp? Had he been wounded? Bill Devon made his way slowly along the highway. His feet slipped on the graveled edge and brought flashes of pain into his knee. The trees on both sides of the road made a tunnel of the highway. He stopped to rest his knee. From above him the trees came the shrill cry of tree toads funny about people calling them toads when they were really frogs. Bill wondered if he ought to go back and have Tim drive him home. No, better go on, he thought. It wasn't more than the length of three football fields to where Aunt Martha lived. By the light of a car coming up from behind, Bill saw a girl coming toward him. In the momentary light, he took in the flowered yellow dress, the dark hair, and the lovely eyes. Then darkness fell between them. What was she doing out on the highway alone? probably on her way to the school grounds. Why hadn't she come earlier? She might have put some fun into life on a nice summer evening. Talking to her would have been much more exciting than talking to young Muscles. Bill chuckled softly to himself as he recalled Muscles' reply to the question, Is Father Tim a good coach? Yes, sir. He's the best coach in the league. He sure knows a lot of trick plays. You like trick plays? Sure do. They're fun. Does Father Tim get right in there and show you how to block and tackle? Once in a while, but mostly we practice our trick plays. Do they work? They would if the other teams didn't have such big guys on them. They get in and bust them up for us. And Father Tim shows you how to hold the ball for throwing passes and how to punt? Ah, he don't have to show us that stuff. We all know how to do that. I'll bet you won the championship with all those trick plays. Not this year. St. Stephen's won it, but we'll win this fall. Sure you will. Where did your team finish last fall? In sixth place. How many teams are in the league? Six. Say, did you play football in college? Yes. Where? Notre Dame. Notre Dame? No foolin'? No foolin'. Gee, stay here a while, will you? I want to get some of the guys. Be right back. Within three minutes, Muscles had come back with three other boys, all members of St. Mary's football team. He had enjoyed the half hour spent with the young football players, but that same time spent talking with that lovely girl would have. A pistol shot cracked through the warm night air. That was no car backfiring, Bill thought. Where had it come from? Up ahead? 
Who'd be shooting around here at this time of night? Well, it was none of his business. He'd amble along toward Aunt Martha's. He passed the sign which he knew read, Galton, population 21,398. He was now at the city limits, and yet for over a mile down the highway were large homes with beautifully landscaped grounds. He knew he would have to get across the road to his aunt's home, but, as he remembered from earlier in the evening, this side was better to walk on, so he'd stay where he was for the present. He had just reached the break in the hedge and stepped onto the cement driveway leading into the Linton property when there was a rustle in the shrubs and a soft step behind him. Then something hard was pressed against the small of his back. Walk up that driveway, a low voice said. There was another sharp prod in his back. Bill stood still with legs widespread, feeling his pulse slugging at his temples, neck, and wrists. Furious resentment at being held up this way raced through him, straining at every muscle. He wanted to turn and swing a heavy blow at the shadow behind him, but the gun at his back prodded viciously. This was the first time he'd ever had a revolver poked into his back, for he felt certain that what was pressing his shirt deeply into his flesh was something with a bullet in it. Could it be that this was the same gun that had fired the shot he'd heard a few minutes ago, and who was behind him holding the gun? For a moment he considered using some commando tactics to get out of the spot, but when he thought of the quick movements it would require to turn and grab the weapon arm and throw his assailant down, he knew he couldn't do it. The pain in his leg warned him not to try it. He would not be able to move fast enough. Bill started to turn his head, but the prod came harder, almost making him lose his balance. Don't look around. Just move. Bill limped slowly up the driveway. When he had gone about ten feet, the voice said, Stop. At the same time, an arm reached around his left side, and something hard bumped against his chest, while the gun at his back continued to bore into him. I'm holding another revolver out in front of you. It's not loaded. Take hold of it. Bill fumbled around, felt a gloved hand holding a pistol by the barrel. He grabbed the butt of the pistol, and instinctively his little finger felt to see if the clip was in place. The empty hole assured him it had been withdrawn. Pull the trigger, the voice said. Bill hesitated a minute. What could he do with the guy holding revolver at his back? Should he wheel and swing now? Pull the trigger. You have no other choice, the voice said, as if he'd read Bill's mind. Bill pulled the trigger and heard the click. What was this all about? Craziest thing that had ever happened to him. Maybe the guy holding the pistol at his back was insane. This was one spot a fellow had to be careful in if he wanted to get out alive. He let go of the pistol and immediately the arm dropped from in front of him. Now walk back to the road and keep going. Bill turned with relief. The spot on his back where the gun had been held felt warm, burny. Queer feeling having a gun held at your back. Even the twinge of pain in his knee did not slow his progress as he began to move. Not hearing any sound but his own footsteps, Bill knew that the man was standing in the shadows, watching him, waiting for him to reach the highway and move on. When he reached the clump of shrubs and his feet touched the gravel at the side of the road, he thought he heard footsteps running across the lawn, away from him and toward the Linton home. He stepped back among the bushes, spreading them without thrust arms. When in a position to see the house, he saw a dark figure move across the terrace, a shadowy figure in the soft glow cast by the lights from the living room. End of chapter 3「Father Tim leaned heavily against the warm bricks of the schoolhouse wall, weariness gnawing deeply into his bones. He looked around him with a feeling of satisfaction. Eleven boosts were erected already. They looked gala with their strings of very colored lights and the drapery of bunting. In a short time, the remaining three would be completed, and then he would call it a day. It had been a long one, starting with a sick call to Mrs. Huntmeyer at 4.30 that morning. What he needed was sleep. Good thing Father Kearney was saying the seven o'clock mass this week. He wouldn't have to get up until 7.30, in time for a little meditation before the eight o'clock. The heavy hammering of the early evening had given away to an occasional tap or two, Father Tim looked at the men who were finishing the last booths. 
They must be tired, too. They worked all day at their different jobs, hurried through their dinner, and came over here to put in another two or three hours' work, but from their banter and laughter he knew they were enjoying themselves. A sharp report cut through the warm night air, most likely a car backfiring, but it sounded almost like a gunshot. Who would be doing any shooting around here? He watched John Linton and Father Kearney walk slowly down the midway from the far end of the festival grounds, both intent on one another's words. What good friends they were! Father Kearney had a staunch supporter in John Linton, a fine man, a fearless editor, and daily communicant. If the city could get a few men like Linton in office, there would be an end to graft and chicanery, he thought. Evening, Father. Father Tim looked up to see Mary Jo Linton smile as she walked quickly in the direction of her father. He watched as she met him, said something, and stood by while Linton spoke to Father Kearney. After a moment, Linton lighted a cigarette, and with Mary Jo beside him, walked over to where Mrs. Linton was talking to Mrs. Young. Then he and Mary Jo got into his car and drove out of the grounds. Lights from another booth winked on as bulbs were screwed into the sockets. Two more to go, and the men working on these were in a good-natured race. After a few minutes, almost simultaneously, the lights of these booths lent more brilliance to the scene. Men and women, their work finished, lingered on, talking and laughing, as if unwilling to break off the evening's companionship with their neighbors and friends. Father Tim pushed himself away from the wall and started toward the rectory. He would put away his hammer, wash his hands, and then come back for a final check to see that everything was left in good order. When he reached the gate to the flower garden, he met Mary Kearney, the pastor's sister and housekeeper. "'You're wanted over at Linton's, Father. Your brother just phoned and asked me to tell you he was in a bit of a jam.' For a moment a great many mixed-up thoughts raced through the priest's mind. Why would Bill telephone from the Lintons? Had he fallen and caused further damage to his knee? One thing sure, Bill wouldn't have phoned unless something serious had happened to him. He didn't say what was wrong? No, Father, that's all he said. Thanks, Mary. I'll see Father Kearney and tell him where I'm going. Will you please put this hammer away for me? Mary Kearney nodded. The hammer exchanged hands, and Father Tim turned back toward the schoolyard. Father Kearney looked sharply at the young priest. Your brother wants you at Linton's? Better get into some other clothes before you go. Father Tim nodded. Thanks, Father, I will. I forgot how I was dressed. A gentle smile played on the older man's lips as he watched his assistant hurry toward the rectory. He had never seen him move quite so fast. Worried about his brother. Surely, though, it couldn't be anything serious when Bill had made the phone call himself. Father Tim almost ran down the road to the Linton home. Anxiety added inches to his stride. Mary Jo Linton met him at the door, her face pale and her eyes full of fear. Come in, Father. He felt an overtone of excitement about him as he stepped inside. At the far end of the hall, beside the circling stairway, he saw Bill seated on a straight chair, rubbing his knee. He walked over to his brother. What's up? Sweat beaded out on Bill's forehead. Plenty. There's been a murder here, and I'm in it up to my neck. You're in it? Yep. For a moment, Bill looked gaunt and lonely. Then with a rush of words, he tumbled out the story, eager for someone to hear and believe him. I was on my way to Aunt Martha's from your place when I heard a shot. I didn't think too much of it at the time. None of my business. But when I got to the driveway leading to this house... A guy stepped out from behind the hedge and put a pistol to my back. He made me walk into the darkness of the driveway. Did you get a look at him? I didn't see him at all. He was in back of me all the time, boring the muzzle of his pistol into me until it felt as big as a cannon. Then he reached around in front of me and handed me a pistol. He told me it wasn't loaded and to pull the trigger. I felt for the clip, but it was out. Anyway, I didn't know what kind of a nut I was up against and all the time he was pushing the other pistol halfway through my back, so I took hold and pulled the trigger. After he took the pistol from me, he made me walk back out to the road and told me to keep moving. Believe me, I did. I was glad to get away. Until then, I thought I was up against some sort of lunatic, but when I remembered the shot I'd heard a few minutes before, and that my prints were on that automatic, I began to think the situation through, so I stepped in among the bushes and watched. I saw a man run across the terrace, 
toss something into the house through the open French doors, and disappear in the darkness at the west side of the house. I knew it must be the pistol that I had put my fingerprints on. And was it? Father Tim asked. Yes. Why do you suppose he did that? Because he just murdered a man named Blake, in there. Bill raised his hand and pointed toward the living room. Suddenly Father Tim became conscious of the day's heat trapped within the walls of the house. He took his handkerchief and ran it around the edges of his collar. Immediately his mind went to the murdered man. Turning to Mary Jo, he asked, This man, Blake, was he a Catholic? No, Father. Father Tim stepped to the entrance of the living room. On the floor, under the glare of a floor lamp, he saw the body of Sam Blake. Blood had formed a large stain on the gray-green carpeting. A strong shudder shook him from shoulders to knees. For the space of a half-dozen heartbeats, he stood motionless, taking in the scene of a murder. Then he calmly raised his right hand and made the sign of the cross as he pronounced the words of conditional absolution. When he finished the Latin prayers, he turned to Mary, Joe, and Bill. Thus kneel and say a prayer for the repose of Mr. Blake's soul. White-faced and trembling, Mary Jo knelt between Father Tim and Bill, as the former started, Our Father, who art in heaven. Bill, with his injured knee extended straight behind him, seemed to lose his uneasiness. He replied in a firm voice, Give us this day. The simple, beautiful words sounded through the large room, and came back to Mary Jo, bringing with them a sense of well-being in spite of what had happened. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. May he rest in peace. Amen. As Father Tim arose from his knees, he noticed a hole in the window screen and tatters on the edge of one of the draperies. The shot must have been fired from out on the terrace. He noticed also that a pistol lay on top of a small occasional table near the window. Was that the murderer's weapon? Bill said it had been tossed onto the floor. How had it got on top of that table? And why had the murderer gone to the trouble of getting Bill's fingerprints on the gun? Why hadn't he taken the gun away with him? Father Tim rubbed his moist palms against his trousers and turned to the strained faces of Mary Jo and his brother. Your fingerprints are on that gun? Not any more, Bill replied. I wiped the pistol clean with my handkerchief. That's why I'm here. I got thinking how easy it is to check prints and how Uncle Sam has mine. So I decided to get in here get the gun, and wipe it clean. That's what I was doing when Miss Linton walked into the room and caught me. Father Tim could see that Bill was in a bad frame of mind. His nervous energy goading him to impetuous action, while his injured knee compelled him to remain quiet. What did you think when you saw Bill standing there with a gun in his hand? I'm afraid I didn't do much thinking. I just screamed. My stomach felt like it had a yo-yo flip-flopping in it. I'd have dropped in my tracks if your brother hadn't come over and helped me to a chair. Then Dad came in. Where's your father now? Upstairs with Mother. She's terribly upset. You know she has a bad heart. When I told Dad over at the festival grounds about Mr. Blake being here, we came home right away, but Mother stayed talking to Mrs. Young. I don't know why, but they must have decided to leave right away, too, because they dropped her at the drive just a few minutes after Dad and I got home. So she was in on the first shock of it all, too. Dad took her upstairs, and he's still with her. He asked your brother to call the sheriff and the coroner. We're waiting now for them. Father Tim looked at Bill. What a position to be in. His mind raced wildly. What could he do for him? On hearing soft steps on the carpeted stairway, Father Tim turned to see John Linton coming toward them. His usual bright, even color, now a splotchy gray. He stopped mid-stairs and lighted a cigarette. Then he nodded. Glad you're here, Father. This is a bad spot your brother's in, and it could get worse. All depends on what Sheriff Benteen wants to make of it. The news opposed his election last fall, and since this took place in my home, he may try to be disagreeable. I believe it will be better if I have nothing to say, one way or the other, about your brother's presence. You'd better handle it. Father Tim made no reply. This was something entirely new to him. In the thirteen months since ordination, he had seen death come several times. He had tried to succor those in trouble. He had visited a man in county jail and one in the state prison, 140 miles away. But this was the first time he had ever come up against the law when the suspect was someone close to him. 
Bill Devon looked at his brother and then at John Linton. I don't see why I need to be brought into this at all. No one saw me come in here, and I don't even know the man who's been killed. Outside of you three and Mrs. Linton, no one knows I was here. We could put the pistol back on the floor and let the sheriff take over from there. I have no connection with this. Linton leaned on the newel post at the foot of the stairs and looked sharply from Father Tim to Bill. I see your point, but I don't believe it would do. Sooner or later I'll be placed under oath to tell exactly what I know about the events here this evening. The same is true of Mary Jo and Mrs. Linton. We could not honestly omit telling that you were here. No, it's better that you be in this from the beginning than brought into it later. You would surely be under greater suspicion then. As things stand now, you are merely a victim of circumstances. Father Tim nodded. That's right, Bill. It can't be any other way. Mr. Linton is right. No one can hold you for murder. You had no motive. I didn't even know the guy. Never saw him till I entered the room a few minutes ago. You believe me, don't you? John Linton eyed Bill soberly. Yes, of course, but it's not a question of what we believe. It's what the sheriff will think. Suspicion feeds on little things that do not make up a reasonable answer. Your story is fantastic, even though true. The full realization of Mr. Linton's words came to Father Tim as he stood there searching for the meaning of all that had taken place. He agreed with Linton that Bill's story sounded fantastic, yet he knew that Bill had no connection with the murderer. He looked at Bill and gave him a confident smile. For a brief moment, Bill felt the gentleness of his brother's smile, and then reality smashed back at him, and his aggressive temper flared up. He'd not just sit here while the events of the night touched him with bloody fingers. His jaw muscles tightened and his lips formed a straight line. He slapped the arms of his chair with a gesture of open temper, his voice rising sharply in anger. Tell the sheriff anything you want. I'm leaving. Father Tim laid a restraining hand on his shoulder. No, Bill, this is something you've got to see through. You can't walk away from it. Don't make it appear worse for yourself than it is by leaving. Bill took a step forward, then stopped. This is a fine mess to come all the way from Korea to get into. He returned to his chair and sat down wearily. Father Tim saw the hint of approval in Mary Jo's eyes. Turning to her father, she said, I think I'll go upstairs to Mother. Do that, honey. She may need you, John Linton said. As she passed him on her way upstairs, Father Tim noticed the dusting of freckles on her upturned nose. Cute, he thought. Now why couldn't Bill make the most of meeting a nice girl like that? He'd be back in civilian life soon, and a guy like Bill needed a wife to steady him. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Roman Colored Detective by Grace and Harold Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Five. Without a preliminary knock, the front screen door burst open, and Sheriff Greg Benteen, florid, important, meticulously dressed in a gray suit, strode into the Linton home. He was a large man, and his silver gray hair, hazel eyes, well-cut nose, and generous mouth had made his election posters inspire confidence throughout the county during his campaign. With him was his mild, self-effacing deputy, Charlie Reynolds, who had been kept on by the sheriff because of his past experience. Benteen's eyes took in the three men in the hallway. He gave them a nod of recognition. "'My office got a report of a murder out here, Mr. Linton,' he would have liked to say, John, but couldn't quite bring himself to it. This made him feel ill at ease. He enjoyed being in company where he could toss around first names, slap men on the shoulders, and dominate the conversation with his deep, rich voice. Somehow in the presence of John Linton, he was never able to play that role, and it irked him. John Linton nodded and moved toward the living room. In here, he said. The sheriff stepped forward quickly, but stopped when he saw the body of Sam Blake on the living room floor. For a moment, every muscle became numb. Charlie Reynolds pulled up short to keep from bumping into him. Although Benteen knew from Bill's phone call that it was murder, he was upset. Murder was new to him. The sight of Blake's body unnerved him. His face turned gray, and his lips tightened. He wished he knew what to do under the circumstances. This sort of investigation could be tricky. But he couldn't stand here doing nothing. 
he'd have to act fast with John Linton as spectator. Benteen beckoned with a jerk of his head to Reynolds, and then walked across the living room toward the open French doors. The sight of the pistol on the table stopped him. How'd that get there? Reynolds shook his head. That's something we've got to find out. Right. Benteen glanced over his shoulder at the body, and then toward the screened window with the hole in it. From the way it looks, Blake was shot by someone standing outside that window. Reynolds nodded. Benteen pointed at the pistol. Then how did that get there? The deputy jerked his head backward toward the hall. Maybe someone out there would know. I'll find out, Benteen said. You better get the camera from the car. When the sheriff returned to the front hall, he averted his eyes from the body, then looked about until he saw John Linton, who was seated on a low bench beside Mary Jo. While my deputy takes some pictures, I'll have to ask you a few questions, Mr. Linton. Linton nodded. Certainly. Who killed Blake? I have no idea. Were you here when he was shot? No, I was over at St. Mary's school grounds, helping to erect booths for the summer festival. Who was here at your home? No one. You mean to say that Blake was here and none of your family was here with him? Linton then explained how Mr. Blake had come to see him, how Mary Jo had asked him to wait in the living room while she went to the school grounds to get him. Why did he come to see you? Benteen asked. I don't know. You didn't have an appointment with him? No. The sheriff rubbed some color into his cheek with the palm of his right hand as his mind reached deep for another question. Father Tim could see that he was a man slow to think things through. He felt sorry for him in the present situation. He realized that Benteen knew that his thinking things through accurately and quickly could mean the price of re-election. Deputy Reynolds came through the front door carrying a camera. As Benteen's eyes followed Reynolds, he picked up the pieces of his shattered importance. Get some good shots from all angles, Charlie. Also one of the gun on the table. Then at the thought of the incongruity of the pistol being on the table, he turned back to Linton. Was that gun on the table when you came in? You didn't touch anything, did you? No, everything is just as it was when I got here. However, the pistol was originally on the floor. Captain Devon, Father Devon's brother who is home, wounded from Korea, put it on the table. Captain Devon can tell you himself how it came about. Benteen frowned. You shouldn't have touched that gun, Captain. How did it happen that you were here to move it while the Lintons were away? For the third time, Bill gave his account of what had happened to him that evening. He was interrupted near the end of his story by the arrival of Dr. Porter, the coroner, a thin, bald, efficient man, who greeted everyone affably and went immediately to the living room to examine the body. The sheriff waited in the doorway until the examination was over, and then joined Dr. Porter to converse in low tones. After a few minutes, Dr. Porter beckoned to Linton to come into the living room. Got any ideas about this, John? Dr. Porter asked. None, Doc. It has me completely baffled. Do you think it has any connection with your editorial in tonight's news? For which, by the way, let me offer my congratulations. It was a masterpiece. You poked your fingers into some sore spots. Do you suppose, since Blake was one of the commissioners, that it could tie up in any way? John Linton did not answer immediately. He stood watching Benteen, who had joined his deputy across the room, to give additional instructions for pictures he wanted taken. When he did speak, the words came slowly. I have been wondering about that myself, but I can't quite see the connection. Why would anyone follow Blake to my home and murder him here? It doesn't make sense. Dr. Porter shook his head. It's a shame it had to happen in your home, John. Benteen's going to have a ballistic test made but I don't suppose there's any doubt the pistol found in there was the weapon used. I'm having Blake's body brought to town, so I can remove the bullet. It took a downward course. Benteen told me about Captain Devon's part in the affair. Somewhat incredible, isn't it? Linton thought a slight shadow crossed Dr. Porter's face before he added, Do you believe him, John? Certainly. He had no part in this except as circumstances implicated him. I think he did what any man would have done in a similar situation. It's an ugly thing to know your fingerprints are on a gun that killed someone. What does the sheriff think? Porter gave Linton a wry smile. He doesn't know what to think yet. I'd say he's greatly confused about the whole affair. But then, who isn't? Here he is now. You ask him, John. 
Linton turned to the sheriff who had come up to them. I just asked Dr. Porter what you thought of Devon's account of what took place here this evening. Do you believe it, Doc? Benteen countered. I see no reason not to, although it is mighty incredible sounding. The shot was fired from out on the terrace, leaving him no reason to go into the house, except as he stated. Unless, Sheriff Benteen said. Unless what? Linton asked. Unless he was on the terrace when you drove in. He's got a bad lag and couldn't run for it, so he stepped inside and then invented this cock-and-bull story. Makes a pretty good alibi. Devin didn't even know Blake, so why should he murder him? Linton asked. The sheriff's hazel eyes swept upward questioningly. You sure he didn't know, Blake? He said so, didn't he? Sure, sure, he said so, but that's something I've got to look into. He's been around town a couple days. I've seen him, and a guy can meet a lot of people in that time. Blake was a fellow that got around a lot. He had his fingers in a lot of things. Including the sportsman's club, Linton said sharply. He and Lippy Santos own the place. I didn't know that, Benteen said. You mean you don't want to know it? That place should be padlocked. Why, nothing wrong there, just a club. Open to anyone with money to lose gambling. I've been out there, and I've never seen any gambling. Did you go upstairs? No, that's a private apartment, Benteen said. Sure, Lippy's apartment. He sleeps there, that's all. Get your men together some night, and I'll show you the way. You have to swear out a warrant. I'll do that. Good, Benteen forced a laugh. But you won't find anything, and then you'll be in the middle of a lawsuit. Santos won't take a thing like that laying down. When I call on you, Sheriff, I'll have the situation in hand, and you'll find all the evidence you want, Linton replied. What's all this got to do with Captain Devon? Dr. Porter asked. Not a thing, Linton said, except to show what kind of a crowd Blake was mixed up with. There are plenty in that sportsman's club gang who wouldn't stop this side of murder. Sheriff Benteen rubbed his jaw with his hand. You think the captain was out there and lost a lot of money? Couldn't take it and got even this way? Linton's voice lifted slightly. I didn't say anything of the kind. I said there are plenty in that sportsman's club gang who wouldn't stop this side of murder. It had nothing whatever to do with Captain Devon. Sorry, Mr. Linton. I didn't say you said it, but I said you maybe was thinking that. I had no such thoughts. I don't think Captain Devon had anything to do with Sam Blake's death. He's a victim of circumstances. Benteen looked doubtful. I think I'll ask the captain a few more questions. He turned abruptly and stepped up to where Father Tim and his brother were seated, talking in low tones. A question, Captain, Benteen said. Yes, sir. Have you ever been out to the sportsman's club? Linton, who had followed the sheriff, moved over beside Father Tim, an annoyed expression on his face as he heard the sheriff's question. Bill Devon sat silently for a time, thinking before he answered, is that the name of the place out there on Route 12, where Route 7 crosses it? Yes. I stopped there for a drink the other night. Why? The sheriff ignored the question. When was that? Night before last. I drove around for a look at the countryside and to cool off. I saw a sign saying beer. Thought it a good idea. Went in and killed a bottle. See any gambling? No, sir. Anyone with you at the time? No, sir. Did you talk to anyone in there? Just the guy behind the bar. Mind telling me what this is all about? Just an idea that came into my head. Mr. Linton says Blake was part owner of the sportsman's club. What's that got to do with me? Father Tim laid his hand gently on Bill's arm. He could see the sheriff was doing his best to find some connection between the murder of Blake and his brother's presence on the scene. Bill's resentful attitude wouldn't help him at all. It was an ugly thing. Bill being mixed up in such a tragedy. Father Tim had never felt quite so helpless. There wasn't a thing he could do. He looked at the faces of the men around him, mixed emotions written on all of them. He reached into his right-hand pocket and fingered his rosary. Things would work out, he felt sure. Bill was innocent regardless of how much the sheriff might doubt him at the moment. He must counsel Bill to be more courteous in his answers. It wouldn't get him anywhere being belligerent. That might be all right in the army, but not here. 
A ring of the chimes aroused Father Tim from his thoughts, and turned the eyes of every one in the hall in the direction of the front door. John Linton walked quickly to the door and admitted Frank Stone, his partner in the Galton News, and Tedford Wilson, president of the Galton Trust and Savings Bank. "'What's up, John?' Stone asked, peering through his thick lens glasses. Wilson was on his way to talk to you about the editorial in tonight's news, but when he saw the sheriff's car out in front of your place, he came over to my house. When he told me, I suggested that we drop in and see what's wrong. Thought maybe I could be of some assistance. That's nice of you, Frank. Linton then looked at Wilson and added, I'll discuss the editorial with you in my office tomorrow morning, any time after 10.30. Wilson nodded. I'll be there. Lowering his voice, Linton then related what had happened that evening. Father Tim watched the reaction of the story on the two men. Stone's pallid face remained unchanged, although his brown eyes looked about him with curiosity. Hard of hearing, and too vain to make use of the modern hearing aid, Stone kept interrupting with, What's that? I didn't hear. Wilson pulled his shoulders high, straightened his long body as if to rebuff the shock of what he was being told. His dark eyes, well recessed in their sockets, never left Linton's face while he talked. Only the tightness of his small mouth and the way he fumbled in his pocket for a silver cigarette case and lighter showed he was affected. While Linton was talking, Sheriff Benteen walked over and without a word extended his hand to Wilson and Stone. When Linton finished telling of the events of the evening, Stone stepped into the living room, but Wilson merely peeked around the entrance, took one quick glance, and turned his head away. "'Too bad about Blake,' Frank Stone said as he re-entered the hall and walked up to Father Tim. Yes, Father Tim replied. Mr. Stone, this is my brother, Captain Devon. Bill, this is Mr. Stone, Mr. Linton's partner in the news. The two men shook hands. Stone's thin shoulders twitched, and he looked down at his hands, the long tapering fingers opening and closing into a fist. Tough spot for John to be in, having a murder committed in his own home. Guess I'll get out of here. Things like this get me down. I knew Blake pretty well. Guess I'll go home and pour myself a stiff drink. Father Tim thought he detected a faint, sweet odor on Stone. Wine? he asked. Stone forced a smile. That's for you fellows. I make mine bourbon. With that, he walked over to Wilson. Let's go. Tedford Wilson nodded toward Father Tim and Bill, and followed Stone through the doorway. Bill, a belligerent look on his face, watched the two men leave. What's that sheriff trying to do? Pin this thing on me? he asked as he looked up at his brother. You notice he didn't answer that last question of mine. He just walked over and shook hands with those two men. I wouldn't know what he means, Bill, but whatever you do, don't antagonize him. You want me to sit back and let him? Look, Bill, his brother cut in. There's nothing he can say that will stop him from doing whatever he intends to do. He doesn't look overloaded with intelligence, but don't let that fool you. He can make up for what he lacks in IQ by stubbornness. So keep your temper in check. He'll eventually get around to the point where he'll see you couldn't have had anything to do with the murder. His mental mill grinds slowly. Have patience. And in the meantime, he'll have his way. What do you suppose that sportsman club questioning was all about? Maybe the sheriff thought you had been gambling there, lost a lot of money, and carried a grudge, or perhaps couldn't pay up what you lost and had been threatened. The place has a bad reputation. You surely picked a fine spot to buy a bottle of beer. How was I to know? It looked like a classy place. Those places usually do. Money can put on fine trappings. I think Benteen is coming back to question you again, so take it easy. The sheriff walked up to them and stood for a moment looking grim-faced at Bill. Captain, what time would you say it was when you were held up out in front of here? About 9.15, sir. I stayed at the school grounds until about 9.00. I've got a bad knee and can't walk too fast, so I guess it took me that long to get this far. When I was about halfway here, I heard a shot. Why didn't you tell me that before? Didn't have a chance. You were asking the questions, remember? Father Tim looked sharply at Bill and shook his head. Then, turning to Benteen, he said, I heard the shot, too. What time was that? I don't know exactly. I didn't pay much attention to it and thought it was a car backfiring. Shortly after that, maybe five or ten minutes, I got word to come over here, a phone call from my brother. What time did you get here? Father Tim shook his head. 
I don't know. I didn't look at my watch at any time. I could ask Miss Kearney, our housekeeper. She took Bill's message. Or Father Kearney. I talked to him just before I came over. They may have an idea about what time it was. Will you check with them and let me know? I'd like to pin the time down to the second, if possible. I'll phone you in the morning if they know anything. Benteen nodded absent-mindedly and turned again to Bill. Captain, how long do you intend to stay in town? A week or ten days, I guess. Good. Don't leave without seeing me first. Why? Because, the sheriff replied, a man has been murdered, and you messed things up pretty badly. That's why. I'll be wanting to question you further, after I've looked into a few matters a bit more. Feeling the pressure of Father Tim's hand, Bill made no reply. A quarter moon hung in the sky, having little effect on the blinding blackness of the night. Father Tim fumbled for the latch of the gate to Father Kearney's garden, found it, opened the gate, and once again was home. For a few moments he stood there, feeling the peace and quiet of the garden. He looked up at the stars and breathed deeply of the flower-scented air. The mystery and loneliness of the night moved in, closed down on him. Why did trouble have to come into all this peacefulness? People with only half the facts, with exaggerations, would soon be linking Bill's name with murder. And what would he be able to do about it? How could he help Bill? Pray, pray, and keep his eyes and ears open. Father Tim walked wearily up the steps to his room. It was nearly eleven o'clock, and he still had his breviary to read. It had been a long day. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of a Roman Color Detective by Grace and Harold Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Six. The next morning, Tuesday, August twelfth, was fair and held promise of being another hot day. Muscles tagged behind Father Tim as he walked rapidly from the church to the rectory after eight o'clock mass. His thoughts were on the priest. Why had he been so quiet this morning? Even in the sacristy before Mass he hadn't even smiled. He sure seemed different. Muscles tried to think of any mistakes he had made during Mass the day before, but he felt sure he hadn't made any. And today he knew he had said the responses good and loud, the way Father always liked them. As they entered the side door of the rectory, Father Tim said, Go ahead, wash your hands. I've got to run up to my room. I'll be right down and we'll eat. The strong odor of frying bacon made Muscle's nose twitch when he passed the kitchen on the way to the lavatory at the end of the narrow hallway. Muscle's felt at home in the rectory. He often ate breakfast with Father Tim. Faintly he recalled that he had once lived in a house like this, a home with an upstairs and a downstairs, and a yard out and back, with grass in it. That was a long time ago, before his father died. But he liked where he lived now, with his mother, in the four rooms above the Franklin Cut Rate drug store. It really was a swell place. From his bed in his room, he could look down on the street below, watch the people standing around talking, the cars going by, and the big guys from the high school horsing around. They talked so loud he could always hear what they said, and they were awfully funny, almost as good as the comics. Nobody had a chance to read more comics than he did, either. All he had to do was go downstairs to the drug store, squat in the corner by the magazine rack, and read. Mr. Franklin didn't seem to care. Anyway, he had a kind of job there, sweeping out the store Saturday mornings and running errands after school. He pushed aside the white ruffled curtains and looked out toward the school after he'd washed. The windows shone clean in the morning sun, ready for another school year. It wouldn't be long until those same windows would be pasted with pumpkin cutouts. You could always tell what holiday was coming by the windows. A few minutes later, Muscles was seated with Father Tim in the dining room, a napkin across his faded jeans. It didn't hurt if he spilled on his old jeans, but Father said he had to use the napkin anyway. He remembered the time, he said. It's not only to catch the drips, Muscles. You may use it to wipe the egg off your chin right now. When Miss Kearney came in with the orange juice and cereal, she looked at Muscles and smiled. Your ears are like pink shells this morning. I bet your mother scrubbed them for you. Muscles looked up to examine her face to see if she meant it kind or cold. He decided it was kind, because it most always was that way. Yes, ma'am, he said. 
and when he saw Father Tim's frown, he added quickly, I mean, yes, Miss Kearney. Father Tim ate in silence. Muscles didn't like it, so he was glad when Father Kearney came back into the room with Father's coffee. I hope that phone call wasn't anything bad last night, Father. Father Tim sugared his coffee. It was. Very. Then he told her what had happened. Only once did she interrupt with a nod toward Muscles. Little pitchers have big ears. Murder isn't exactly the right thing for... It's all right, Father Tim cut in. After the news comes out this afternoon, everyone in town will know about it. It's just as well that he hears the truth. It was when Father Tim mentioned that Bill had stopped at the sportsman's club that Muscle spoke for the first time. I know the guy that runs that place. His name is Lippy Santos. Father Tim looked up quickly, surprised in his eyes. How would you get to know him? Well, I don't really know him, if that's what you mean. I know who he is. He hangs around a lot with Big Dutch and Rocky down at the central bowling alley, next door to the drug store. I see him a lot. One time he gave me a dollar for carrying a letter for him. Who'd you carry the letter to? Father Tim asked. A lady in the Hilton Hotel. I see. He's a real swell dresser, Lippy is, and he's got a big car and lots of money. Father Tim nodded. Big Dutch and Rocky work for Lippy, Muscles continued. He's their boss, but he's a lot smaller than they are. He's a pretty nice guy. He gives a lot of money away to people that need it. How do you know that? I hear guys talk about him down at the drugstore. Everybody says he's not stingy. I guess that's because he's got a lot of money. Speaking of money, I've got work to do. I have to go to the bank for change for the booths. Then looking intently at Muscles, he asked, You want to earn an honest dollar? Yes, Father. All right, then go over to the school and find Mr. Dutton. Tell him that I said you were to help carry folding chairs and set them up wherever he wants them. He gave Muscles the big grin he liked so well. You'll work for this dollar. Muscles grinned back. Okay, Father. At a quarter after eleven, Father Tim walked up to the teller's window in the Gulch and Trust and Savings Bank to get packages of nickels, dimes, and quarters for the booths. As he left the window, he saw Tedford Wilson standing in the doorway to his private office. Wilson beckoned to him and moved forward with outstretched hand. Dreadful thing last night, he said. Yes, it was, Father Tim agreed, knowing that Wilson had not called him just to make that remark. I wonder if I could have about five minutes of your time, Wilson added. I know that you are busy with festival plans and all. Father Tim glanced at his watch looked up and smiled. I am busy, but not in such a hurry that I can't spare a few minutes. Good. Come inside. Wilson closed the door and motioned Father Tim to a chair and then sat down behind his desk. He reached into a drawer and took out a box of cigars. Smoke? Not now, thanks. Wilson pushed the box aside and wet his thin lips. As I said before, that was a joyful thing that happened at John Linton's home last night. Sam Blake was a fine man. Father Tim nodded. Yes, it was. I didn't know Mr. Blake, but I'm sure he was a good man. Father Kearney told me that of the three commissioners, he felt Mr. Blake had the public's interest most at heart. One of the best. Wilson wet his lips again. I just came from a talk with Linton over at the news about the reservoir. He's stubborn on this business and won't agree with the commissioners on the site. He's a member of your parish, isn't he? Father Tim nodded. Wilson leaned forward. I'll come right to the point. I'm as much interested in that dam as Linton is, maybe more so because I've got money invested in most of the industries in town. And these shops need water, lots of it. If this drought continues, they may have to shut down until we get some good rains. Now, for no good reason, Linton is booming the Hearts Corners site. It's a good one, I'll concede that, and it will impound more water. In years to come, if the town grows... We may have to build another dam there, too. That's Mr. Linton's objection, Father Tim said. He thinks one dam, located at Hart's Corners, will take care of both present and future needs. Your way would incur the expense of two dams. Wilson forced a smile. That all may be, but a dam built just below your church, although it wouldn't impound as much water, will be quicker and less expensive to build. Father Tim wondered as he listened. 
Every one in town knew these facts. Why was Wilson taking up his time for this recital? The appropriation for a dam was approved by the voters last spring, Wilson went on. Approval was given for the commissioners to select the site. It was probably an unusual way to put the matter before the public when the site had not been selected. Yes, Father Tim thought. It was unusual. Could it be that they had not wanted the matter of a site settled before the election? It looked as if these men thought they could force through the local site once the money was appropriated. But we save the money by not having to have a special election to get the approval, Wilson continued, although we did have to work fast to get it on the regular ballot. Linton has objected to the local site all along, and has delayed everything. His paper carries a lot of weight. The commissioners won't come right out in favor of the local dam until Linton quiets down on his opposition. Naturally, they have re-election in mind. Just how well do you know John Linton, Father Devon? We are very good friends. That's what I thought. Now how about you explaining this to him and trying to get him to see the light? Father Tim glanced at his watch. I'm afraid he knows more about this matter than I do. I see no point in my saying anything to him. But you can see my way of looking at it? It's a matter of opinion. You have yours, Mr. Linton has his, although I feel Mr. Linton's is far more foresighted and economical. Wilson twisted uncomfortably in his chair. I see you don't get the significance of my position. And he went on to repeat much the same argument. When he had finished, Wilson paused for a long moment and looked dubiously at Father Tim, wondering whether to continue. He leaned forward on his desk, lacing his fingers together in front of him, and smiled graciously. As I understand it, you fellows have a great deal to do with forming the opinion of your parishioners. They believe what you say. Now, if you were to go to Linton and point out to him that the local site is a logical one, I'm sure he would fall in line. Sort of crack the whip, as it were, Father Devon. Father Tim rose. He was angry, yet he didn't want his anger to show. I'm sorry, but you've been laboring under a misapprehension. We do no whip-cracking. A man of John Linton's intelligence is able to form his opinions without my help. That was a poor choice of words, perhaps, Wilson said quickly. The words are inconsequential, Father Tim said evenly. The thought was there just the same, regardless of how it was phrased. You seem grossly ignorant of the relationship between a pastor and his flock. We counsel solely in spiritual matters, and in my opinion, the location of a reservoir does not come under the heading of morals. Wilson stood uneasily by his chair, but... Father Devon, you misunderstood me entirely. I felt that if, perhaps, you could talk with Mr. Linton and get him to see how much better it would be to cooperate with the county commissioners in their plans, rather than to hold up the progress, it would be to the betterment of everyone concerned. If you could see your way clear to speak to Linton and get him to see the other side, I would be glad to make a substantial free will offering to your festival fund. Father Tim moved toward the door. I see I have stayed longer than I should. Good day, Mr. Wilson. The gears clashed as he set his car in motion and drove back toward the rectory. Wilson would never have had the audacity to approach Father Kearney with such a proposition, he thought. Had he handled the situation correctly? Wouldn't it have been better to cut Wilson right down to the floor instead of leaving quietly? No, that wouldn't have been charitable. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of Roman Color Detective by Grace and Harold Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 7 Mary Jo Linton puttered around her bedroom that same afternoon. She had decided to spend the day at home with her mother who stayed in bed most of the day, to recover from the shock of the previous evening. She moved her dressing-table bench in front of her dresser. This would be a good time to straighten out dresser drawers. She looked around her room. It was large, done in Williamsburg blue, with some watercolors she had made at Cape Cod two summers before, highlighting the west wall opposite the open casement windows. She looked closely at one of the pictures, a marine province town harbor and wharf, with the fishing boats at anchor, 
The water looked cool, inviting. It would have been a fine afternoon for a swim at the country club. The chimes of the mantel clock in the living room, striking two, were almost drowned out by the discordant shrillness of the telephone. Mary Jo ran quickly downstairs. She didn't want the phone to ring too long and disturb her mother. As she passed the door from the hallway to the living room, she grimaced, although there was nothing left in there of the night before except memory. The husky, hello, sent its vibrations into the phone. That you, Mary Jo? Jerry, where are you? Home, just got in. Her lip corners twitched before a smile formed. She sensed the release of all her restlessness. Jerry Laughlin was home. She could see him, his close-cropped, stiff blonde hair, his gray eyes, and his familiar grin. But I thought you were going to stay up there two weeks. We were, but my total haul for the week was one lonely bass, and it was too small to keep, so I tossed it back into the lake to keep company with its mate, if it had a mate. That's too bad. Here I had visions of you pulling them in by the dozens. Not me. Then it started to rain. Ever been in the north woods when it rains? No, Jerry. It's the weather, D-Day. The clouds slap you with everything they've got for a while, and then settle down for a long, dreary, and I mean dreary, rain. After three days of that, sitting in a shack, Hank and I decided we were licked, so we tossed our gear into the car and headed back for the States. Welcome home, Isaac. Walton knew more angles than Hank and I, but there are a lot better things in life than fishing, and you're one of them. I'll be right over, okay? Give me ten minutes. Ten minutes flat. Be seeing you. Mary Jo cradled the phone and took the stairs two at a time. With Jerry back in town, life could be fun again. She tucked the curly ends of her dark brown hair into a bathing cap and prepared to take a shower. She'd planned what to wear as she bathed. She hadn't seen Jerry in over a week. The stinker. She'd missed him. He was important to her, she'd have to admit. The yellow linen sundress with the bolero top. No, she didn't want to be typed into the woman who always wore yellow, even though it was a good color for her. With a deft movement, she turned off the shower and wrapped herself in a huge towel. She'd wear the new shell pink chantung. It would be cool with its cap sleeves. It didn't make too much difference what she wore. They'd probably just sit around and talk. She couldn't remember when she had ever dressed so quickly. She hummed gaily as she brushed on her lip rouge. It was good to have Jerry home, to be able to listen to his quips. Mary, Joe, and Jerry sat in the glider on the terrace, Jerry listening intently to her account of the murder and of how Captain Bill Devon had become involved. The gears in the captain's noggin must have worked overtime concocting that one, Jerry said as she finished. Don't you believe his story, Jerry? It's hard to swallow. It's no bite-sized portion. I don't see why not. If you could see him and... Look, Mary Jo, Jerry cut in. The idea is stamped all over as prefabricated. Why would a mysterious murderer, after shooting Blake, with no one around and plenty of time to get away, hang around to get the captain's fingerprints on the pistol? I agree with the sheriff. This guy got caught in the trouble zone when you and your dad drove up. So he stepped inside. He couldn't run for it. Your dad would have caught him easily. But we wouldn't have seen him. Maybe you wouldn't, but he didn't know that. Anyway, you'd have heard him. A guy with a game leg makes an awful racket trying to run. But he had no reason to kill Mr. Blake. He didn't know him. Look, Mary Jo, people murder for all kinds of reasons. You read the papers. We've only his word for it that he didn't know Blake. And don't forget, he's just back from the fighting front. Maybe his behavior pattern is all scrambled. Maybe it's schizophrenia, dementia pericos, or something screwy. You've read of guys coming back and running amok. Don't talk like that. Jerry looked at her, his eyes questioning. Why not? He's Father Devin's brother, and he's not crazy, if that's what you're trying to imply. She was surprised at the intensity with which she had come to Captain Devin's defense. She knew her voice had been sharp, but she couldn't help it. She just didn't doubt him. Jerry's eyes drew together. His lower lip began to push out as he sat in thought. Then his grin sneaked out. So his brother's a priest, therefore he can do no wrong. I didn't say that. That's what you implied. 
I know a priest who has two brothers who are doing time in the state clink for about every crime from arson to... Jerry paused. What's a crime beginning with Z? Mary Jo laughed. I don't know. I thought you reporters knew all the words. Jerry leaned forward, running his thumb down his fingers as if tolling off the words for the last letter in the alphabet. Guess there isn't any. The letter Z stands uncontaminated, spotless, pure, as far as I'm concerned. If you knew Captain Devon, you would see that all you said about veterans' psychosis doesn't apply to him at all. Maybe so, but his story sure sounds like a dud. What an imagination. Mary Jo didn't want to say more in Captain Devon's defense, nor to antagonize Jerry. He'd see for himself when he met him. You still covering Sheriff's office? she asked. Sure, I'll be right in the middle of this when I get back to work. I may even go back to work tomorrow and take the four days I have left of my vacation later on, maybe in October and go hunting. I'd like to know what's cooking. Can't understand Blake, a county commissioner, getting shot while in your home. Doesn't make sense. You don't suppose someone... Jerry stopped as he saw a car turn into the driveway. Looks like you're getting company. Mary Jo looked toward the drive. It's Father Devon and the captain. Hmm, some wagon the captain drives. He's a man of expensive tastes. That's a snazzy convertible he's got. Taking you for a ride yet? Hardly. I just met the man last night, but I feel there's a good chance he will. Remember, you're only guaranteed for life, one life. Better think it over before you take him up on it. That wasn't one bit funny, Jerry. I didn't intend it to be. Mary Jo stood up and walked to the edge of the terrace. Jerry joined her, and they stood in silence while the two men got out of the car and walked toward them. After Bill had been introduced to Jerry, Father Tim said, we drove over to ask you a few questions, Mary Jo. It won't take more than a few minutes. Sorry to barge in when you have company. That's okay, Father. Then turning to Bill, she said, We were just talking about you, Captain. Bill Devon smiled ruefully. So is the rest of the town. Do sit down, Mary Jo said. Jerry remained standing after the other three had seated themselves. If this is private, I'll take a stroll and admire the flowers. Father Tim shook his head. No need of that. We just want to ask Mary Jo a couple of questions about last night. Jerry joined her on the glider. I warn you, Captain, Mary Jo said, to be careful what you say in front of Jerry unless you want to see it in print. He's a reporter for the news, supposed to be on vacation right now, but that doesn't mean a thing if he finds a choice bit to write about. Right, Jerry? Jerry grinned. Right. Mary Jo looked at Father Tim. And the questions, Father? Maybe you'd better ask them, Bill. Bill nodded. Sheriff Benteen called me down to his office about eleven o'clock this morning and questioned me about my part in last night's show. Frankly, he doesn't believe a word of my story. He insists no one held me up and got my fingerprints on the pistol. Now you saw me coming down the highway and passed you, didn't you, Miss Linton? Yes, I did. Where would you say we passed each other? Mary Jo frowned. I remember it was after I'd passed the city limits sign, but how far is hard to say. Is it really important? It may be. Then again, it may not. It all depends on where you remember you were when you heard the shot. But I didn't hear any shot. You sure of that, Mary Jo? Father Tim asked. I heard it clear up on the school grounds. Yes, father, I'm sure. Or at least, if I did hear it, I didn't pay any attention to it. There's always a car backfiring out on the highway, and there was hammering going on up in the schoolyard. Bill wet his lips. He was hoping Mary Jo had heard the shot, and could testify that it was before they passed each other on the road. I'd rather banked on you having heard the shot, Miss Linton. I heard it a minute or so before I met you. Mary Jo shook her head. I don't remember hearing it honestly. Then it's pretty important to pin down where we passed each other. The sheriff seems to know something, but he hasn't told me what it is. I think he's got the exact time when the shot was fired. He's trying hard to put me on this terrace at that time. Where would you say we passed each other? I'd say it was about sixty or seventy yards beyond the city limits sign. I remember, 
I thought of taking a shortcut into the schoolyard, and then I thought of the poison ivy patches along there. So I went on to the driveway. You didn't look at your watch before you left home? Bill asked. No, I didn't. I wish I had, if it would have helped. I guess that's about all, then, Miss Linton. It looks as though I'm in this pretty deep. The sheriff was plenty rough this morning. He seemed to think he had something new today, but as I said before, he didn't tell me what it was. He did say that the ballistic expert found that the automatic I wiped off was the one which fired the shot that killed Blake. It was a French thirty-two caliber automatic, one of those pistols made by the French under Nazi supervision during the occupation. Some G.I. probably brought it back and forgot to register it with the sheriff or chief of police like he should. At least this one wasn't registered. The sheriff thinks that because I'm in the army, I'm the only one who would get my hands on a pistol like that one. Why, after the war, every other G.I. brought back some kind of weapon. Those thirty twos were popular. Our boys really liked them. They've got a lot of power and put the shots where you want them. I could have bought one like that from a G.I. when I was in the Navy, Jerry said. Sure, I tried to tell Sheriff Benteen that anyone could have bought that pistol from some Joe who was hard up for cash, but he wouldn't listen. He kept insisting that I was the only one who could have had it. He kept tossing that up every two or three minutes. Why do people elect a guy as thick-headed as he is to office? Surely they know what he is before election, or do they? No one answered that question. A heavy silence followed. Father Tim could see that Bill was worried and subdued, not like the previous night when he'd been scrappy and impatient. He wondered what this new fact was that the sheriff claimed he had. Jerry ran his hand across the top of his bristly hair, as if he liked the feel of it. That's odd stuff with the police, Captain. Just a fishing expedition. The sheriff claimed he knew more than he did, just to get you to change your story. He didn't get any more fish than I got up north, which was none because you didn't change your story. There was nothing to change, Bill said. Then he's right where he was last night, Jerry said. I wish I could think that, but he was so confident. Even after we were through talking and I was ready to leave, there was a satisfied look in his eyes. The last thing he said was, I'll be locking you up within the next 48 hours. They were all silent for a moment. Mary Jo moved uneasily in the glider, how about a cold drink? she asked. Bill's eyes showed appreciation. I could use a stiff one. Mary Jo laughed. The stiffest drink you'll get around here is ginger ale. You should hear Dad on the evils of drink. He can preach a better sermon on that than you, Father. Father Tim smiled. That wouldn't be hard. All my sermons are poor. I like them, Mary Jo said. Because I keep them short. Not necessarily, although that is in your favor, but you get your point across. Thank you. I'll remember to tell Father Kearney that. I think he'll be surprised. By the way, how was your mother this afternoon? She's resting. It didn't do her heart any good, but she'll be all right when the excitement of it all dies down. She stood up and started to walk toward the French doors which led to the living room. Want some help? Jerry asked. No, thanks. You better stay here. Less noise in the house, the better. I don't want to wake Mother if she's asleep. Father Tim watched Mary Jo until she went inside the house. Then he turned to Jerry. How well did you know Mr. Blake? Not too well. Speaking acquaintance. Did it ever strike you that he and Mr. Linton looked very much alike? Jerry laughed. Yeah, forcibly. I followed Blake for a half a block one day into the Hilton Hotel, thinking it was the boss. I noticed the resemblance myself last night, but I didn't want to bring up the idea in front of Mary Jo to worry her. If the murderer came onto the terrace and saw Blake sitting in the living room with his back to the window, he could easily have mistaken him for Mr. Linton. Bill blew out a long, Whew! Maybe you got something there, Tim. Father Tim nodded grimly. The idea has been running in my mind ever since last night. Did you mention this to Sheriff Benteen? Jerry asked. No, he might think the idea queer, coming from me. Well, I don't, Jerry said. I'll make it a point to tell him. You may have something in that, Father. But who would want to murder a good man like John Linton? 
Could be a political firecracker. Editors should all wear bulletproof vests. Jerry replied. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Roman Color Detective by Grace and Harold Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Eight. After leaving the Linton home, Father Tim and Bill drove to the Sportsmen's Club at the junction of Routes Twelve and Seven. When they pulled into the deserted parking lot beside the yellow brick building, Father Tim looked nervously at the clock on the dashboard. It was 3.25. He should be back on St. Mary's grounds now, checking to see that everything was in shape for the opening of the festival. And here he was, four miles from there, and headed for an interview, which could be time-consuming. He'd have to be back by 4.15. As they entered the club, Father Tim was blinded for a moment, while he struggled to adjust his eyes to the half-dark, air-conditioned interior. He stopped awkwardly behind Bill, and glanced around the expensively furnished room. Two men sat facing each other in a booth, and at a table in the rear, a man worked with a pencil, checking a small pile of papers. From behind the bar, a heavy-set, red-faced bartender eyed them dourly. He leaned forward, forearms on the bar, as Bill approached. "'Remember me?' Bill asked. "'I was here last Saturday night, about eight-thirty, and got a glass of beer.' The bartender raised the fingers of his right hand, looked from Bill to the man checking papers in the rear, then back to Bill. A lot of people come in here for a beer. Saturday night's a busy time. Father Tim watched the man at the rear table push the papers against the wall, get up, and walk toward them. He was thin. His black hair was greased down, and a faint hairline mustache made an indelible mark on his pallid upper lip. Afternoon, Father. Anything I can do for you? I'm Santos. Jules Santos. Father Tim introduced himself and Bill. Then, after a brief outline of the murder of Blake the evening before, he said, My brother stopped in here Saturday evening about 8.30 and got a glass of beer. He's here to establish the fact, but your bartender seems unable to remember him. Santos's face creased in a frown. What's wrong with coming in here for a beer? Sheriff Benteen seems to believe I came here to gamble and that I lost a lot of money, which I couldn't pay up, Bill said. He thinks you guys were after me to pay, and that for some reason, because of that, I killed Blake. Benteen sending for a motive. Santos tried for a disarming smile, but the nervous twitch of his mustache told Father Tim that he didn't like being questioned. Benteen knows there's no gambling here, Santos said. Why, we just serve food and drinks. He looked at the bartender. How about it, Danny? You remember this man now, of course. Sure, sure I do. He came in last Saturday night about 8.30 and got a beer. Sat on that end stool up front, didn't you? Bill nodded. That's right. Santos rubbed his hands together. Good, that settles it. The bartender's face became a smiling full moon. He'd said the right thing. The boss was satisfied. Santos turned to Father Tim. How would Benteen get me mixed up with Blake? I don't know. Why, all I'd do is rent this building from him. Mr. Blake was my landlord, that's all. I don't get it. Benteen knows I've quit gambling. I'm clean now, ever since the government made us guys register and pay a gambling tax. It takes all the profit, and it attaches a stigma to the club. All I do now is operate this place. Eats and drinks, that's all. Santos laughed harshly. Benteen doesn't need to come here to find gambling. It's done in some of the best homes in town and it's not Penny Ante either. Nothing wrong about a bunch of guys getting together for an evening's recreation, losing a few bucks, just so it doesn't bring hardship on their families. That kind of gambling can be charged up to entertainment, Bill said. That's not the games I'm thinking of, Santos said. There's some of Galton's rich guys who play for big stakes, and I hear one of them bends going to the cleaners regularly. He took a step toward Father Tim and whispered, I think you know him, Frank Stone. Father Tim nodded. Santos stepped back, rubbed his hands together. Now, what can I get for you, gentlemen? It's on the house. Nothing, thank you, Father Tim said, and moved toward the door. I guess we'll be going. 
Bill followed quietly after his brother. The heat from the leather cushioned seat of the car burned through Father Tim's clothes as he slid in beside Bill, who had taken his place behind the wheel. We should have parked the car in the shade. Bill paid no attention to the remark as he released the brake and got the convertible under way. I'd say Greasy Hare's a liar. John Linton wouldn't make a crack about Blake and Santos being partners, unless he was sure of his facts. Where'd you hear Mr. Linton say that? Father Tim asked. I didn't. Ben Teen said Linton told him last night that Santos and Blake were partners. But he said it wasn't true, that Linton was just saying it to cover up for me. There must be something to it if John Linton says so, Father Tim said. Then he leaned back against the cushions, clasped his hands behind his head, and relaxed in the luxury of the wind blowing through his red hair. Dinner with Father Kearney was no time for trivial talk, no time to discuss problems solved or to be solved. You either ate in complete silence, or, if Father Kearney was in the mood, joined in the consideration of some abstract subject. Tonight he chose to discuss faith. It was hard for Father Tim to keep his mind from his brother's problems, yet with a golden flow of words he was soon listening intently to Father Kearney develop his subject. He leaned heavily on the faith of Brother André, founder of St. Joseph's Oratory in Montreal, and upon the saints of the church. After dinner, Father Kearney said, Come, let's go into my office for a few minutes. Father Tim followed his superior to the office, which adjoined the reception room. He understood. It was against Father Kearney's principles to allow the dinner hour to be marred by a discussion of troubles or problems. Father Kearney was going to give him a chance now to talk about Bill. The pastor seated himself behind his desk, clasped his hands together, and leaned forward, looking kindly at his young assistant, seated in the visitor's chair. Father Tim knew that although he had been given permission to be with his brother during the afternoon, Father Kearney would rather have had him doing his work. He recalled how, on his first day at St. Mary's, Father Kearney had told him not to fritter away the parish's time, because time was the essence of work for the glory of God. "'How did it go this afternoon?' Father Kearney asked. "'Has your brother established his innocence?' Father Tim shook his head. No, Father. On the contrary, he seems to be involved deeper and deeper as time goes on. He then told of Bill's visit to the sheriff's office that morning, of their visit to Linton's and to the sportsman's club. With no results? No results, Father. I know how you feel, Father Kearney said. It's your brother who's involved. However, I see little you can do about it unless you fancy yourself a detective. Father Tim flushed slightly. I have no such delusion, Father. Good. Then we'll get back to our own parish work. We've a festival underway. John Linton gave it a splendid write-up, with pictures in the news today. I do hope we have a good crowd. It's going to be a fine evening, though a bit warm. Speaking of Mr. Linton, I'd like to play detective for a minute, if I may. Father Kearney laughed and nodded. Certainly. Go ahead. I believe Mr. Linton's life is in danger. The pastor leaned forward, attentive. I think Mr. Blake was mistaken for Mr. Linton, and that's how he happened to be murdered. There's a close resemblance between the two men, especially when viewed from the rear. Father Tim then related how even Jerry Laughlin had mistaken them once and had followed Blake, thinking he was Linton. Father Kearney's fingers, which had been clasped in front of him on the desk, were now tapping nervously. For several minutes he sat there without speaking. The small desk clock ticked loudly in the silence. It may be as you say, Father Kearney said. I'll speak to John about it tonight. He should be on his guard. Maybe there's a bit of detective in you after all, Tim, but for John Linton's sake, I hope you're wrong in your deduction. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Roman Color Detective by Grace and Harold Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Nine Father Kearney sat on the lawn bench in his garden, his eyes closed, but his mind racing to formulate what he would say to John Linton. He didn't like what his assistant had said, but he had to admit that there was a possibility of truth in it. 
he rubbed his hand across his forehead and opened his eyes. There was no use not facing the issue. It was there. John was a fearless editor, and his writing carried the weight of a left hook to the jaw for some of the city's leading citizens. He was right in crusading against the graft, which had crept into the county administration, but it could be dangerous to him. He stood up and walked slowly along the garden path which led to the driveway. John should be along soon. He was always one of the first men on the job. He'd stay the longest and do the most. That was the way he worked. When he reached the driveway, he looked eagerly toward the highway. A feeling of inadequacy swept through him as he saw Linton's car turn into the schoolyard. How could he tell him? He knew it was only conjecture on Tim's part, but when you weighed the situation carefully and recalled Linton's opposition to the plans of the politicians, you could see that perhaps Tim was right. Sam Blake wasn't supposed to be lying dead in the funeral home at this moment. John Linton was. Father Kearney walked toward the Linton car, which was circling the parking lot before coming to a halt in the space for the first row of cars. He watched Mary Jo, her arms full of packages, alight from the car, followed by her mother. Mrs. Linton was pale. Even lipstick and rouge couldn't hide that. After he had greeted them, he said, John, if you've got a minute, I'd like to talk to you before you go over to the booth. Okay, Father, let's find a place to sit. My garden bench? Fine. John Linton sank heavily onto the lawn bench. It would be good to sit for a few minutes and talk. He always felt relaxed, inwardly content, when talking to Father Kearney. It had been a trying day, the usual rush of editorial work and appointments. The one with Tedford Wilson that morning hadn't been satisfactory. It was difficult to hold your temper with men like that, but he was grateful it had been a morning appointment. He always did better then, just a few hours away from the communion rail. Father Kearney glanced at his friend, reluctant to start talking. They often sat for long periods, content in one another's company. He looked out across the highway. Linton's eyes followed and rested on the sign which hung high in the air, stretched across the highway. St. Mary's Ninth Annual Festival, August 12th to 13th. Games, dancing, eats, fun. I see Charlie Stanford finally got the sign up. He should have had it up a week ago. Yes, he's had a bad summer cold. Linton noticed the sober expression on Father Kearney's face. Let's have it, Father. You've got troubles? Father Kearney shook his head. No, John, I wish it were that way. Troubles can usually be overcome by sane reasoning and hard work. He paused, trying to speak carefully. For a moment his eyes held Linton's. I hate to cause you any worry or distress, but Father Tim and I both think your life is in danger. Linton's face clouded for a moment, then regained its usual calm. He listened intently while the priest explained how he and Father Tim reasoned that Blake had been shot by mistake. When Father Kearney finished talking, Linton shrugged his shoulders, an unusual gesture for him. For a moment he again had a preoccupied look, then he smiled, his blue eyes nearly vanishing in little folds of flesh. Hunting season's closed on editors right now, Father. I wouldn't take this matter lightly, John. All right. Who's gunning for me, and why? Father Kearney looked down at his hands. His deep, rich voice dropped to a hoarse whisper. I don't know. I wish I did. After a pause, he added, You don't suppose this attempt was made because you were editorial about the reservoir? Linton shook his head. No, that has nothing to do with it, if it was an attempt on my life. I only roasted Tedford Wilson and the three county commissioners. One of them, Blake, is now dead. The other two, Vic Jordan and Perry Trust, wouldn't get shootin' mad over what I said. It's just all politics with them. And as for Wilson, he would sue, not shoot. By the way, I had an interesting talk with him this morning. What did he have to say? Just what I told you, that he'll bring a libel suit against the news. He's got Frank Stone worried. Frank has never interfered with the editorial department before. He's always tended to his end, the business office, and I to mine, the editorial. Frank's afraid of Wilson. I would be too, John. Wilson has money and power. You better be sure of your facts before you print them. I am, 
as sure as a man can be about skulldudgery like this. And I told Frank I was sure. But even after I showed him what I've got on Wilson, he insisted I forget about the side of the dam and scrap the editorial. Of course I'll not do that. Why, matters are even worse than I thought. Wilson's son-in-law has options on the low land of eleven farms on the other side of the creek besides the land he bought outright. There's a hundred thousand dollars to be made on that deal. But that's beside the point, father. The dam, where they want it, will not serve the purpose in another five years, the way the town is growing. Father Kearney sat forward on the bench. You don't suppose young Tomlinson, Wilson's son-in-law, got his money from someone else beside Wilson to buy up that land? I've thought of that, but no, it's got to be Wilson. He wouldn't let a chance like this get by him without cashing in on it, especially when his son-in-law's name is used. However, Wilson does insist that he has no part of the deal, but that's to be expected. One thing Wilson said, though, has me stumped. In fact, I'm holding up tomorrow's editorial until I can do some more checking. He said I was due to get the surprise of my life if I continue my present policy. He's got something up his sleeve besides his arm. Maybe he was bluffing. Could be, but if he was, he's the best actor this town's ever seen. A screen door slammed behind them, and Linton turned to see Father Tim come down the rectory steps. Here's your ringmaster. I'd better get to my booth and get to work. The two men stood up and waited for Father Tim, whose easy smile grew with each approaching step. After they had exchanged greetings, Linton said, Don't you ever get Father Kearney worried over me again. If you have any more ideas, tell me, not him. The gloom around here could be cut with a knife. Father Tim laughed. I'll do that, Mr. Linton. But just the same, watch out for yourself. Because, if we're right, whoever shot Blake knows now of his mistake and will try to correct it. The three men walked along in silence. After about ten steps, Father Kearney said, I'm afraid you're right, Tim. Linton left them when Father Kearney stopped to talk to several men, getting the fish pond booth ready. Father Tim continued to walk slowly toward the white elephant booth. Crowds were beginning to gather at each place, and the hum of conversation and laughter spread through the grounds. Suddenly Father Tim was conscious that he was not walking alone. He looked down. Hello, Muscles. Hi, Father. Ain't this fun? I like it. You bet it's fun, but wait until everyone gets here and it will be more fun. By the way, I can use you at eight o'clock in the morning. I'll be there, Father. You can have breakfast with me after Mass, too. A grin spread quickly across the freckled face. Thanks, Father. I'll tell Mom. She'll be glad because she thinks I don't eat enough when I get my own meal. She's working early. Father Tim looked at the boy. His slight frame could stand more padding. Suddenly Muscles reached out and took hold of the priest's hand. They both stopped momentarily and looked into each other's eyes. The priest with deep, penetrating kindness. The boy with loving respect. Mom says they were talking about your brother, Captain Bill, down at the hotel at lunch this noon. She heard him while she was waiting on table. So? Yeah, she said a couple of guys said he killed that Mr. Blake, and they must be psycho. What's a psycho, Father? They mean they think Bill is psychotic, Muscles. Father Tim smiled. They think Bill's got rocks in his head. They're nuts, Father. Real nuts, if they say that. I'm sure they are, Muscles. They didn't really mean it. They were just talking. I guess so, Father, Muscles replied, his interest gone. He towed a pebble around, then gave it a kick. You know something? I think we could have a real good team this year if we got start practicing real early. We will as soon as school begins. I know, but if we started earlier than that, we'd be a lot better, wouldn't we? I suppose we would, but we've always waited until after school gets underway. Muscles worked another pebble into place to be kicked. Maybe that's why we get beat all the time. We don't get enough practice. Now, I was thinking that if we could get started next week, maybe Captain Bill would help you coach us. Father Tim laughed. So that's it, is it? Yes, Father. Well, I suppose it will work out all right, if Bill will do it. You'll have to talk to him. Is he coming over here tonight? He said he was. Oh, boy, I'll see him and ask him. 
I got to go now, Father. Be seeing you. Muscles turned to leave. Don't forget eight o'clock mass. I won't, Father. He looked over his shoulder, and his freckles, like so many curled flakes of copper, got wrinkled up in his grin. And I won't forget breakfast, either. Father Tim's eyes followed Muscles as he ran swiftly up the midway, dodging in and around the crowd, which was assembling rapidly. For a moment he saw himself, a boy of eleven, in Muscles' place. How quickly time passed. And he was wasting time now. Father Kearney expected him to move among the parishioners, welcoming them, taking hold of his responsibilities as assistant pastor, as a second host to all the members and friends of the parish who came here to help them raise money for parochial needs. He must get moving, get to work. He turned in search of Father Kearney, and saw he had moved back to the front of the booth, where John Linton was working. Suddenly the lights along the midway came on, cutting into the lingering moments of the day. The grass, which had been a dead gray carpet, was now transformed into glinting strands of gold. He walked slowly through the crowd, a smile on his lips, a warm greeting for everyone. He was asked to try on an apron, a pretty frilly red one, by a group of laughing women of the Ultra Guild in charge of the apron booth. He wondered if they would have been shocked if he had. He'd often worn one of Mom's and helped his sisters with the dishes, even when he was a seminarian home on vacation. He liked aprons. They were the uniform of a noble profession, he thought. The smell of hot dogs, frying hamburgers, and onions made his mouth water while he lingered to talk to one of the cooks, Big Art Kessler. But he wasn't hungry enough to eat anything now. Maybe later with Bill. He dropped in to watch the square dancing in the recreation hall in the school basement. In the center of the floor, Mary Jo and Jerry Laughlin were twining in and out, clasping hands with the others, laughing gaily above the crisp words of the caller. His eyes swept the seats along the wall. In the far corner, Bill sat, wearing the set smile of a person in a crowd, where everyone knows everyone else well except himself. Father Tim made his way around the edges of the hall to where his brother was sitting. He nodded toward the dancers. You give a lot to be out there. Right. Well, why sit here and torture yourself, then? Come along with me, and we'll parade the grounds. There's lots to see, and it's not bad fun. Oh, I'm doing better than that in a few minutes. I'm taking Mary Jo for a ride, as soon as this dance is over. We won't be gone long, as she has to relieve one of the other girls in her booth when her boyfriend comes along. Father Tim looked down at Bill. Here I was feeling sorry for you, you big mug. You're doing all right. Then he added, Does Jerry know about this? Bill laughed. I don't know, but I don't imagine he does. I'm to meet Mary Jo in my car out on the lot at the beginning of the next dance. She's a fine girl, Bill, Father Tim said. You're telling me. Well, I've got to do my beat. Be seeing you. Okay, but not any more tonight. After I bring Mary Jo back here, I'm going home to Aunt Martha's. Night then, Bill. So long, Tim. When Father Tim got outside, he was surprised to see Father Kearney still standing in front of the country store booth, where John Linton was working. For a moment he was puzzled, until he realized that Father Kearney had appointed himself Linton's bodyguard for the evening. No one with a sane mind would attack Linton with this crowd around, he thought. Sane mind. He felt the skin crawl on his neck and his scalp tingle. Father Kearney was away ahead of him. There was no assurance that last night's killer was sane. For the rest of the evening, until he saw the three Lintons and Jerry drive off in John Linton's car, he found himself watching the front of the country store, too. He was glad when the last car had left the lot, the lights were turned off, and the school grounds were in darkness. Now, without the lights, he could see the stars, millions of them. It had been a long day, but working for the Lord was no eight-hour shift. In the Linton home, John Linton anxiously watched while his wife climbed the stairs. You okay, dear? he called up. Yes, John, fine. Then I'll join Mary Jo and Jerry in the kitchen for a snack. He walked down the hallway toward the kitchen, stopped at the dining room door to reach in and snap on the lights. His finger paused in midair. Outside the dining room window he had heard a footstep and the rasping sound of disturbed shrubbery. He decided against turning on the light and walking through the dining room. No use making a target of himself. 
he made a half turn and followed the hallway to the kitchen. Ginger ale's already poured, Dad. How about some potato chips or a sandwich? Linton brushed his hand across his forehead and brought it away wet with perspiration. What's the matter, Dad? Guess I'm hearing things in the night. I thought I heard someone outside the dining room window, just as I was reaching in to turn on the light. Jerry set his glass down on the chrome-trimmed table. Maybe you did. Who could it be, Dad? I don't know. Got a flashlight, Mr. Linton? Let's flush him out if he's still out there. Linton smiled ruefully. My only flashlight is in the glove compartment of my car. Mary Jo looked worried. Jerry, what are you going to do? Look, Mr. Linton, you go out front, turn off the hall light, and stand back in the shadows where you can see out through the door. I'll go out here and back and make a bit of noise. Whoever it is will run for the front, and maybe you can see him. All right, Jerry, but don't go off the back porch. Make your noise from there. Okay, I'll go out as soon as you snap off the hall light. Do you have a revolver? No, I've never kept firearms around the house. Too many accidents. Mary Jo's eyes were filled with fear. I don't like this idea one bit. Either of you might get hurt. We don't know who's out there. That's what we want to find out, Linton said. Ready, Jerry? Yes, sir. Linton went into the front hall, snapped off the light, and took his stand against the wall inside the open door from where he could see anyone running down the drive. He berated himself for not having a flashlight. Tomorrow he'd stop in at the hardware store and buy two of them, two good ones, and keep them handy in the kitchen drawer and in his own room. His thoughts were jarred by Mary Jo's scream. Turning quickly, he dashed down the dark hallway toward the lighted kitchen. Mary Jo was not there. He ran out the open door, across the porch, and almost stumbled over her as she knelt beside Jerry, prone, seemingly lifeless, at the top of the steps. Linton dropped to his knees, reached out, and found Jerry's wrist, put his fingers on his pulse, but in his excitement could not feel anything. He heard a soft groan, and with it the panic left him. Jerry was still alive. Get inside, Mary Jo. I'll bring him into the kitchen. Linton lifted Jerry by the shoulders and dragged him across the porch and into the lighted room. He heard Mary Jo shut and lock the kitchen door before she collapsed into a chair. He looked anxiously at the red welt across the side of Jerry's forehead above the right eye. A trickle of blood seeped out from a small cut. Jerry moaned again, turned his body slightly, and looked about with dazed eyes. Color came back to Mary Jo's face, and a feeling of relief surged through her as Jerry moved to sit up. Jerry looked from Linton to Mary Jo, who by now was down on her knees beside him, her arms supporting him around the shoulder. I never saw him, he said. He moved his legs and slowly got to his feet. He sure socked me. Sit down, Jerry. I'll get you something to drink. Don't worry about me. I'm okay now. Sure wish I had seen who it was. He came out of nowhere, and wham! I was out. Mrs. Linton's anxious. What's the matter down there? Reached them from upstairs. Linton turned to Mary Jo. I'll go up to Mother and tell her what's happened. On my way down, I'll bring some methiolate and a bandage for that cut. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Roman Color Detective by Grace and Harold Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Ten. Jerry Laughlin's hat was always a source of comic relief to everyone in the editorial room of the news. How it stayed on his head and could still be so near to sledding off backward while he beat out an item on his typewriter was a mystery. It was with his hat in this position exposing the ugly welt partially covered with adhesive tape, that Jerry sat, Wednesday morning, typing the story of the attack on himself the previous night. For a time the words came easily and rapidly, dripping off his fingers as fast as he could record them. It was when he reached the point where Sheriff Benteen had arrived at the Linton home, in response to John Linton's report of the incident over the telephone, that the words became tangled in a web. 
Jerry chuckled to himself as he thought of how Benteen and his deputy had gone about investigating for the assailant and the weapon. They had warned any prowler within a quarter of a mile by their loud talking and the way they played their flashlight beams in wide arcs through the darkness. Maybe that was one way to keep alive, never corner a rat. But what the sheriff had said while he was having a cup of coffee in the Linton kitchen, after the search was given up as futile, made Jerry sit back now and think. Benteen had looked squarely at him and said, Maybe it was a good thing you went out on the porch and got cracked on the head. I think the killer saw Mr. Linton go past the dining room door toward the kitchen, so he went around and back, up on the porch, and was going to shoot him from there. Your going outside saved Mr. Linton's life, because the killer knocked you out, probably with the butt of his gun, so you wouldn't see who he was. Then he beat it. Benteen's next statement had really upset him. Benteen said he'd been in Hart's Corners, parked in front of Green's General Store, about a quarter to ten, when he saw Captain Devon and Mary Jo drive in, go around the village square, and then head back toward Galton. Mary Jo admitted that they'd taken a ride during one of the dances, since the captain wasn't able to dance because of his injured leg. Jerry shook his head as if to clear his thoughts. He'd never get this story written if he kept considering all the unrelated details of last night's adventure. But he hadn't liked what the sheriff said to Mary Jo before he left the house. If I were you, Miss Linton, I wouldn't take any more chances going out alone with Captain Devon. Jerry's fingers tapped irritably on the keyboard of his machine. Bill Devon would bear close watching. Just because his brother was a priest didn't pin any wings on him. What's the matter? Won't the words come? Jerry looked up into the thick lenses of Frank Stone's glasses. Stone was leaning over his shoulder to get his reply. They're all tied up in a knot. I can't unsnarl him. What did you say? Stone said, tilting his head sideways. Then, without waiting for Jerry to repeat, Stone pointed to his forehead. Don't tell me you bumped into a doorknob. That's my stock answer, Jerry replied. He hated trying to talk to Stone in the editorial room. Why didn't the guy get wired for sound? He looked across the room to see heads turning, grinning at him. Whitey Duff was holding both hands cupped in his ears. Jerry got up. Let's go out in the hall where there isn't so much noise. Good idea. Leaning against the wall of the landing at the top of the stairway, Jerry told Stone what had happened to him the night before and what Sheriff Benteen had said about the killer having come up on the porch to shoot Linton. Jerry could see the distress in Stone's face. "'John's got to take care of himself. He's got to watch out,' Stone said. "'No telling when another attempt will be made. I think you should go to the police and get a bodyguard. They might put one here in the office, but not at home. He's out in the country.' "'Makes no difference. The news pays enough taxes to have him protected wherever he is.' It's got to be arranged. What has the sheriff done about that soldier, Captain Devon? I can't believe that story he told. I don't either, Jerry said. I talked to Devon yesterday afternoon, and he said the sheriff had given him a going over. Benteen threatened to bring him in and book him in the next forty-eight hours. Sten leaned forward, listening intently. Forty-eight hours, eh? What's he waiting for, if he's that sure? I don't know. More evidence, maybe. He doesn't have much to go on that I can see, and he's got to find a motive. Stone peered down the stairwell, deep in thought. There's talk that this Captain Devon is a case for a psychiatrist. I've heard that, too. Stone remained silent, rubbing his lower lip against his teeth. Suddenly, with his usual abruptness, he walked to the door of the editorial room. He stopped momentarily in the doorway. I've got to warn John. Jerry followed him into the editorial room, and as he sat down at his desk, he watched Stone, shoulders thrust back, head high, walk rapidly into Linton's office. Queer duck, Jerry thought. Some day he's going to walk himself right into an air shaft. Jerry put his hand to his head. He didn't like the way it had been throbbing since noon. It didn't make sense that his head should pound like this so late in the day, when it hadn't during the morning. He set his pipe down on the desk beside his typewriter and reached out to answer his phone. Jerry Laughlin speaking. This is Father Devon, Jerry. How's the head? Hasn't been too bad, Father, 
but it's aching a bit right now. How'd you find out about it? Muscles told me. How did you know I was back at work? I'm supposed to be still on vacation. Muscles told me. There was a chuckle at the other end of the wire. Is there anything that kid doesn't know? He's usually pretty well informed, Jerry. He has a good listening post in the drug store. There was a moment's pause. Then Father Tim continued. I wonder, Jerry, if anyone has been down to see Mrs. Blake about the reason her husband went to Mr. Linton's home Monday night. Yes, Father. Smith, who has been covering my beat while I was vacationing, said he was out there yesterday afternoon. They wouldn't let anyone see her, especially reporters. Why? You got a hunch? Maybe you could call it that. I would just like to know why Blake went to see John Linton. Somehow I have a feeling that it could be very important. Jerry glanced up at the wall clock. It was 2.30. I can get away in about ten minutes, and I'll make a try at it. Maybe she'll be sympathetic with me. I got a bump, even if not bumped off. If your head's aching, you better take it easy. It's not that bad, Father. You know best how you feel. If you do decide to go, will you let me know what you find out? Sure thing, Father. Where'll I get in touch with you? I'll be here at the rectory. I'll either drop out to see you or give you a ring, okay? That will be fine, Jerry. Thanks. Jerry put down the phone and leaned back in his chair. What was going on in the Padre's noggin? He was too smart a cookie to be wasting his time inquiring into Blake's call on Linton, unless there was really something there. It was hot in the car as he drove through the business section to Willow Creek Road, where he turned east toward the Sycamore development, the site of Blake's recently built home. His head felt better. Maybe it was the fresh air. The office had been stuffy. He turned off the road at a big sign advertising Sycamore Developments, and parked his car in front of the Blake home, under an immense tree, whose scraggly trunk was mottled with patches of yellow. An elderly woman, bent with age or arthritis, answered his knock. She listened patiently while Jerry introduced himself as a reporter from the news, but told him Mrs. Blake wasn't up to seeing any reporters. Jerry gave her a smile turned his head, and pointed to where he had been struck on the forehead. He explained how it had happened. You see, this is very personal with me. I think the man who knocked me out killed Mr. Blake. The old woman sighed, and the cords in her thin neck stood out. I'll see what Mrs. Blake says. After what seemed to Jerry like a long time, she returned and pushed open the screen door. This way, please. Mrs. Blake was seated on a davenport in the living room. Jerry could see she was exhausted from the strain she had undergone. Here eyes, swollen from crying, were red-rimmed. What surprised Jerry was that she looked so young, at least fifteen years younger than her late husband. He took the chair she indicated across the room from her. Sitting on the edge of the chair, he leaned forward and told her as quickly as possible about how he had been attacked the night before. Mrs. Blake, I feel that the person who hit me was the same one who killed your husband. She made no reply, but bit her lower lip and sniffed back a sob. Have you any idea why Mr. Blake went to see John Linton at his home last Monday night? Jerry asked. For a long moment she sat motionless, staring at a spot on the carpet, as if it fascinated her. It was all politics. It was always politics. That's all Sam seemed to be interested in lately. I know, Jerry said. Mr. Blake was a very public-spirited citizen. Was there any particular thing he went to tell Mr. Linton? She shook her head. He never discussed his political views with me. He knew I didn't like him being in politics. I told him from the start it would only mean trouble. I never saw anyone who went into politics and didn't get into trouble. He'd be living now if he'd taken my advice. Had Mr. Blake been threatened? Not that I know of, but if he had, he wouldn't have told me anyway. He's not one to worry me. I'm terribly nervous, been under the doctor's care for over a year now. Jerry nodded sympathetically. Was Mr. Blake in favor of building the dam below St. Mary's Church? He was at first, I think, 
but I overheard him say to Aggie, that's Mrs. Ripley, who has been staying with me, helping me with the house, that he had decided in favor of the Hart's Corner site. I'll ask her. She called, not loudly, Aggie. The old woman, who must have been in the dining room, listening, came immediately. Aggie, didn't Sam tell you the other evening that he was all for putting the new reservoir at Hart's Corners? Mrs. Ripley seated herself beside Mrs. Blake on the Davenport, and looked at Jerry with stiff dignity. Yes, he did. He said Mr. Linton was right, and that any of the commissioners who voted for the dam to be right here in town would never get re-elected. He said the public ought to get a break once in a while. It looks as if Mr. Blake went to see Mr. Linton last Monday to tell him he changed his mind, Jerry said. I really don't know, Mrs. Blake replied. At 3.15, Jerry pressed the doorbell at St. Mary's Rectory. The interview with Mrs. Blake hadn't taken long, and he certainly didn't have much to report to Father Tim. He reached up and put his hand to his head. He'd better go right home after seeing Father Tim and crawl into bed. Far down the valley, a locomotive let go with three blasts of a whistle. The shrillness made Jerry wince. Miss Kearney let Jerry in and showed him into the office where the young priest was seated writing. "'Let's go out on the sun porch. It's shady there now, and not as warm as in here,' Father Tim said. After they were seated, Jerry described his interview with Mrs. Blake. "'I'm sure you're right in your conjecture that Blake went to see Mr. Linton to tell him he favored the Hart's Corners site,' Father Tim said, when Jerry had finished. "'It's not much help, but it does prove one thing.' Politics is at the bottom of this. I think so, too, Father Tim said. It puts a new light on the whole thing, and that perhaps we are wrong in thinking the murderer had mistaken Blake for Mr. Linton. It may be that the murderer followed Blake to the Linton home, saw Mary Jo leave the house, and took advantage of the lonely situation in which Blake found himself. Then how do you account for the attack on me last night? Father Tim frowned. Before he could speak, Jerry went on. Sheriff Benteen said last night that he thought the killer was out on Linton's back porch, ready to take a shot at him, when I stepped out and got socked. He thinks my going out there saved Linton's life. I think so, too. Sometimes I believe that all the areas of Benteen's brain aren't underdeveloped. Benton does the best he can, I'm sure, Jerry. From what you just said, I would take it that Benteen thinks Bill is innocent. He must realize that it wasn't Bill who was on the Linton porch. I'm not too sure about that, Father. I think there is some doubt in Benteen's mind, though, or we'd have taken Bill in by now. He still has an eye on Bill. He proved it last night by what he said. What was that? He had seen Bill and Mary Jo out riding, and he advised her not to go out alone with Bill again. So you see, he's still pointing the finger of suspicion at him. Father Tim made no reply. It was hard to believe. For some reason, Benteen can't see that Bill had no part in Blake's murder and was not the person who slugged you last night. That guy's got a one-track mind, Father. Jerry rose, took a step toward the door. May I use your phone? I want to call Mary Jo. I was going to take her to the festival dinner, but this head is getting me down. I'm going home, take an aspirin, and go to bed for a while. If it's better later this evening, I'll come over then. Sure, Jerry. The phone is in the office. Help yourself. When Jerry was about to leave the rectory, Father Tim said, I've been wondering these last few minutes if you'd mind if Bill phoned Mary Jo and offered to take your place at the dinner. He's feeling pretty low, and I'll be too busy to be with him. He doesn't know many. Sure, Father, Jerry cut in. I'll phone him and tell him myself that I'll lend him my girl for a couple hours. Jerry turned to go back to the office. What's your Aunt Martha's number? Father Tim told him. Jerry made his call and returned to the vestibule where Father Tim was still standing. Bill wasn't home. Your aunt said he'd been called to Crescent City by Benteen for a meeting at 2.30 in the county prosecutor's office. Father Tim showed his surprise. Queer Bill hadn't phoned him and told him. Were they going to arrest Bill? I'm worried over Bill, Father Tim said, but I'm also worried over John Linton. 
Two attempts have been made on his life. If they don't catch the murderer, he may be successful the next time. I'm afraid of that, too, Jerry said, and so is Frank Stone. He told me this morning that he was going to ask the police for a bodyguard for Linton. I surely wish he would. I'd feel a lot easier if the police would keep an eye on him. They will, or I don't know Frank Stone. He'll throw the weight of the news at them down at the city hall. Incidentally, Stone doesn't believe Bill's story. When I mentioned that Benteen said yesterday he would probably arrest Bill within forty-eight hours, he said, What's he waiting for? I'm afraid a lot of people feel that way, and are putting pressure on the sheriff. Seeing Father Tim's distress, Jerry added, Public pressure won't supply a motive, though, Father, and Benteen's got to have that before he can convict Bill. They're probably just having another fishing expedition this afternoon at the courthouse. Bill will be here soon and tell me all about it, I imagine. Jerry reached for the doorknob. If Bill does stop, tell him to phone Mary Joe about the dinner. He paused with the door half open. I'll be seeing you later in the evening, Father, if this noggin of mine quits pounding out a rumba. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of Roman Color Detective by Grace and Harold Johnson. The Slipper Vox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Eleven Through the brooding hush and peace of the hot countryside, Bill Devon drove to Crescent City. When he passed the cemetery at the edge of town, a glass of the dashboard clock showed two twenty. He had plenty of time, so he slowed down. Anyway, why should he care if he was late? Why had he said he'd come in the first place? Why hadn't he refused when Benteen called and said he and the prosecutor wanted to talk with him? He should have told them, if they wanted to see him, to come and get him and be done with it. If Benteen was going to arrest him, like he said he was, why didn't he do it? He was two minutes early for his appointment as he entered the reception room of the prosecutor's office. An attractive girl looked up pleasantly from her typewriter. Captain Devon? she asked. Yes. Mr. Tabor is expecting you. This way, please. And she moved ahead of him to open the door to an inner office. It wasn't much of a room, Bill thought, but it was better than the one the sheriff had over in the county jail. The massive mahogany desk, scarred and scratched, the two sectional bookcases filled with leather-bound law books, and five visitors' chairs made the room seem crowded. The top of the desk was bare except for one small piece of pink notepaper, a memo pad, and the pistol with which Sam Blake had been murdered. The sight of it made Bill wary. The prosecutor, a lean, middle-aged gentleman with a restless body and a good-natured face, got up when Bill entered and stretched his hand across the desk. "'You're a prompt, Captain. I suppose that's the Army training. My name is Tabor. He gave off the suggestion that he moved, talked, and made decisions with nervous speed. "'Take a chair, any one. I noticed your limp as you came in. Leg bother you much?' "'It's very painful at times. "'You used to play with Notre Dame?' "'That's right. "'Guess you won't be doing much running or kicking for a while yet. "'What did the doctor say? "'Will you be able to run again?' "'He believed that in time I would. "'Have you tried it yet?' "'No, it hurts too much even when I walk.' "'Tabor then asked the name of the hospital "'where Bill had received treatment in the States "'and the names of the doctors who had cared for him, "'both here and in Korea.' He sat silent a moment, as if to fix the names in his mind. With an easy graciousness, Tabor took out a pack of cigarettes. Cigarette, Captain? Thanks. Tabor took one and lighted both Bill's and his own from a silver pocket lighter. Bill looked at the cigarette, then at the prosecutor. This was a new twist to the same old piece of business, he thought. The prosecutor was giving him the friendly treatment. He'd read about it many times in books and magazines. Is this your standard routine with criminals, Mr. Tabor? Tabor gave Bill a humorous, owlish look. I should say not, but then you aren't a criminal. Seems to me you and Sheriff Benteen are trying hard enough to make me one. Where is he? He said he was going to be here. The prosecutor fixed his powdery gray eyes on Bill and regarded him with firm attention. At the last moment I decided I didn't want Benteen here, as you inferred. Maybe Benteen is trying overly hard to prove that you murdered Sam Blake. 
After all, it's his job. But until he brings you in and books you, you are a free citizen. As for myself, I'll consider you that until you are brought to trial and convicted. I did, however, want to talk to you. I'd like to hear your side of the story firsthand. We'll both benefit from it. You'll have a chance to remove the finger of suspicion pointing at you. And, if I believe what you say, we'll forget about you, and I'll see that Ben Dean puts his efforts to more fruitful endeavors. There's no compulsion in this. You are free to get up and walk out right now. What you say is just between us two, but I would appreciate your cooperation. Bill frowned. You're making a big mistake in wasting your time on me. Tabor smiled blandly. I don't suppose anyone has lived without making mistakes and having regrets. So, as you say, this may all be a mistake on my part, but I'd like to hear your side of the story. Okay, Bill said. I've told it so many times that once more won't matter. Where do you want me to start? I understand you have been over to St. Mary's Church, visiting your brother before the murder took place. Suppose you start from there. Bill watched the prosecutor closely while he talked. Tabor wasn't as cool and casual as he would have Bill believe him. For somewhere within him, emotion worked strongly, and left its fugitive impression on his face. Bill could see it in his eyes. Tabor's mouth held a forced smile, but his eyes showed when he was irritated or disbelieving. Bill knew from the softly put questions with which he interrupted occasionally that Tabor had the mind of a good trial lawyer, diagnostic and precise. It was when Bill got to the place where he passed Mary Jo Linton on the highway that the fixed smile left the prosecutor's face, and he asked the question which Bill knew he was going to ask. "'You say you heard the shot before you met Miss Linton? I understand she's not hard of hearing, yet she didn't hear the shot at all. How do you account for that?' Hard thoughts drew Bill's eyelids half together and gathered wrinkles in his forehead. This guy, despite his easy front, wasn't believing a word he was saying. He was sitting back, picking flaws in the story. I wouldn't know. She said maybe she heard it, thought it a backfire, and paid no attention. Y you heard it and knew it for a gunshot. I just got back from where there was plenty of shooting. Naturally, I'd know a shot when I heard one, and I'd wonder where it came from. You get alert to those things at the front. Your brother, Father Kearney, and a number of others heard it from as far away as the school grounds, and yet Miss Linton, who was much nearer, did not. Doesn't that seem highly improbable? Not if she thought it was a car backfiring. She wouldn't pay any attention to it, and it wouldn't register in her mind. The prosecutor didn't press the point, and allowed him to continue. Bill felt that he'd won the round for Tabor was hard put to keep his mask of easy good humor in place. When Bill finished the account of his actions the night Sam Blake was murdered, Tabor leaned forward on his desk, put his hand across his eyes a moment to think. Then he glanced at a sheet of paper on his desk. Bill knew it contained questions thought out in advance. Where were you last night at 11.15? Tabor asked. I was out driving around. Around? Where? The countryside? Alone? Yes. That seems to be a favorite pastime of yours, Captain. Anything wrong with it? Yes and no. He stared at Bill with a controlled grin, but it makes it hard for Benteen to prove you were someplace else. You see, he knows you were out with Miss Linton until about 10.30. You told her you were going home when you left her. How did it happen you went for a ride then, alone? I did start for my aunt's home, and intended to go right in and go to bed, but it was warm, and I wasn't sleepy, so I thought I'd buzz around a while. I don't see anything wrong in that. Tabor sat silently for a long moment, the weight of his judgment pressing down hard on Bill. He was no longer smiling when he asked, How well do you know Mrs. Cotter, who lives next door to your aunt, across the highway from the Lintons? I've met her a few times on my visits here. Is she a good friend of your aunt? They're good neighbors. Mind telling me what this is all about? No, Captain. You see, on the night Sam Blake was murdered, Mrs. Cotter took a stroll across her front lawn. She saw you turn into the Linton driveway, but she didn't see anyone hold you up, as you claim. What's more, she says she believes the shot was fired after you entered the Linton driveway. Bill sat motionless, his vision blurred, a choking feeling in his throat. He couldn't breathe deeply enough. When he moved his hand across his forehead, it came away damp and clammy. 
a paralyzing fear swept through him. He felt that Benteen and Tabor were slowly, inexorably, building up a case of circumstantial evidence that would send him to prison, if not to the chair. Tabor rubbed his hands together idly, and a whispering sound filled the room. He was waiting for Bella to speak, and what was there to say? They had him pinned down flat. You want to change your story now, Captain Devon? The words hit Bill like a fist. Change his story? There wasn't any story to change. If he could only think what to say, if only Tim was here with him to help him think this through, to steady him. The thought of Tim soothed him. Tim wouldn't get upset like this. He'd take his own sweet time figuring the thing out before he spoke, and he'd have faith that God would direct him. Mrs. Cotter had seen him go up the drive, but hadn't seen the other man. So what? Nobody could see with all that shrubbery. The guy was in the shadows. Slowly his poise returned as the first wave of fear left him, when his mind began to rationalize. He knew he shouldn't let Tabor see that he was afraid. A man speaking the truth should never be afraid. Bill looked squarely into the prosecutor's eyes. There is no story to change. Remember, I told you the guy was in the shadows of the bushes when he held me up. It was pitch black there, so, of course, Mrs. Cotter didn't see him. But she must have seen me come right back out within a minute or so. Then I watched the guy run across the terrace and toss the pistol into the Linton house. I didn't go up the drive that time. I went through the bushes and across the lawn. Didn't she see me do that? Tabor pursed his lips, then forced a smile. I don't know. I'll inquire. Excuse me a minute. The prosecutor got out of his chair, walked into the adjoining room, and closed the door. Bill knew he was going to phone either Benteen or Mrs. Cotter, but why hadn't he used the phone here on his desk? Had Tabor tried to make it sound as if Mrs. Cotter was sure she had heard the shot after he'd gone up the driveway? If she believed that, she was confused. Old people got confused easily. Why, she must be way past seventy. Tabor re-entered the room and sat down. With no reference to Mrs. Cotter, or whether or not he had telephoned her, he picked up the pistol. This is the weapon which killed Sam Blake. Do you recognize it? Bill nodded. Did you at any time own this gun or one like it? No, sir. With an abrupt movement, Tabor arose. That's all, Captain. It was nice of you to come over. Bill's emotions were a mixture of anger and apprehension when he left the prosecutor's office. He wanted to get away from the courthouse, get away from Crescent City. His foot was heavy on the throttle as he drove the ten miles to St. Mary's Rectory. He was eager to tell Tim of this new development and all the talk about doctors and hospitals. He knew they wanted this information for further investigation. Were they trying to make him out a mental case, a returned, unbalanced, trigger-happy soldier? Bill found Tim in the office of the rectory and told him briefly about the interview. When Tim told him about Jerry's message, he left immediately. For the time being, anyway, he was going to forget his worries. He'd phone Mary Jo and ask her to go to the dinner at the festival. Father Tim looked at the small clock on his desk after Bill left. It was five minutes after five. He'd have to hurry to dress and get down to the auditorium with the change for Mrs. O'Brien and Mrs. Fenton, who were to act as cashiers for the first hour, until some of the men of the Holy Name Society could relieve them. As he dressed, his mind whirled with the thoughts of all that he had to do during the evening. He made a mental note to tell Father Kearney, before he went over to the school, about the possibilities of a bodyguard for John Linton. That should ease his pastor's mind. He would have to see to it that the additional paper plates, napkins, and cups, which had been delivered at the rectory, got over to the auditorium. There were supplies to accommodate a thousand diners, but at the last report the committee said sold over twelve hundred tickets. Besides, many people would come without a ticket and pay at the door. Father Tim paused before the crucifix on the wall of his room and knelt down. Hurried or not, he knew there would be time for everything after he had given a few extra minutes to God. He reached into his coat pocket and extracted his rosary. The first glorious mystery, the resurrection. He thought of how happy Jesus and his blessed mother must have been on that day of resurrection. With the saying of each Hail Mary and the moving of his fingers along the black beads, Father Tim felt renewed strength, a greater peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. He arose, creased his pants at the knees, replaced his rosary, 
and started down the three flights of stairs. He walked unhurriedly from the rectory to the recreation hall in the basement of the school. The auditorium had been transformed into a dining room, with long tables made of boards laid across trestles and covered with white cloths. Low, squat, red pottery pitchers filled with zinnias, cosmos, and marigolds centered the tables. After leaving additional tickets and the change with Mrs. O'Brien, seated at a card table at the entrance to the hall, Father Tim moved toward the kitchen. Aware of a squeaking shoe beside him, he looked down. Hello, Muscles. Hi, Father. Where'd you come from? Oh, I've been waiting a long time, Father. Your shoes squeak. It's a lap one. They're new. Muscles was all dressed up, and his face shone with a recent scrubbing. Are you here for the dinner? Father Tim asked. Oh, yes, Father, and I'm going to eat an awful lot. I've got an adult ticket. Mr. Franklin gave it to me. Fine. When are you going to eat? As soon as they let me. I've been waiting. Father Tim glanced at his wristwatch. They'll be serving in a little while. I'm going into the kitchen now, and I'll see if I can hurry them up a bit. We can sit together if you want. I have to eat early, too. Sure, Father. That'd be swell. As he turned toward the kitchen, Muscles clutched his sleeve. Captain Bill's going to coach our team. Going to help you get us started. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Do you suppose he'll show us some Notre Dame tricks? Father Tim pursed his lips. I'm sure he will. In fact, I'll tell him to. Oh, boy. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of Roman Color Detective by Grace and Harold Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Twelve. Captain Bill Devon picked up his leisure coat, brushed it, and put it on. He thought Mary Jo had sounded very sincere when she said she'd be glad to have him join her mother, dad, and herself at the festival dinner. Bill smiled when he recalled how casual Tim had been about Mary Jo. Tim had said that he would have to eat dinner early and be out on the festival grounds, and he suggested that Bill call and ask to take her. Was Tim trying to be Dan Cupid, or had he merely felt sorry for him? Either way, it was a good deal. With a final jerk at his tie, a forefinger flick at a speck of dust on his coat lapel, and another brush at his black wavy hair, he was ready to go. When he drove into the Linton driveway, he looked to the right and left at the shrubbery near the highway. It was dense, tight, and high. He could see that it had made a perfect hiding place for the person who involved him in Blake's murder. Just in time, Bill, Mary Jo said, as she answered his knock. Come right in. We'll be ready in a few minutes. Yellow sure is her color, Bill thought, as he followed her into the hall. The yellow linen dress she was wearing was perfect, with her dark hair and eyes and her lovely tanned arms. She smiled and added, Come into the library. You're just in time for family rosary. We usually say it immediately after dinner, but when we're going out, we do it before. You'll join us? Oh, sure. A guy never knows when he'll need a few extra points. The tables were filled when the three Lentons and Bill reached the auditorium. They went inside, and John Linton's eyes swept the room from wall to wall, corner to corner. We'd better wait here near the entrance for Frank and Peggy, he said to his wife. Yes, I imagine the Stones would enjoy it more sitting with us. We'll have to wait for the next table anyway, Mother, Mary Jo spoke up. The places are all taken now. My, the food smells good. Bill watched with interest how quickly the committee handled the large crowd. He marveled at the deftness with which the men in their white aprons and caps served the food, hot from the kitchen, where the altar society members worked to keep the plates filled. As soon as part of a table was empty, Young women of the sodality cleared away the dishes and set new places. It wasn't long before the Stones arrived. Peggy Stone, tall and slim, was dressed smartly in a black and white print, accented with red accessories, expensive red kid sandals, a red straw clutch with matching straw bag. She forced a smile when introduced to Bill. She lacked the gracious friendliness of Mrs. Linton, he thought. Frank Stone's eyes never left his wife careful to catch the slightest whim, which she indicated with her starry eyes or a pucker of her pretty small mouth. Bill thought there was also a lack of cordiality in Stone's voice when he said, Glad to see you again, Captain Devon. Why was everyone acting as if he carried the plague? 
John manages to get me to church once a year, even though it is only to a dinner in the basement, Stone said. I guess I'm one of those individuals so wrapped up in myself, looking after my personal comforts, that I never find time to think about eternal life or my soul. Right, John? Not exactly, Linton said thoughtfully. A man wrapped up in himself makes a pretty small package. I say you are anything but that, Frank. While they walked toward a table with room at one end for the six of them, Bill heard Peggy Stone say, I was telling Frank today that I wish we had a swimming pool of our own. We have plenty of room for one at the back adjoining the garden. John Linton chuckled. Get half what you wish for, Peggy, and you'll double your trouble. They took their places at the table, the Lintons and Bill on one side, the Stones on the other. Mrs. Stone had a way of talking almost inaudibly and in vague half-sentences, which was hard to follow. As she addressed the whole of her conversation to Mr. and Mrs. Linton, Bill gave all his attention to Mary Jo, which to his way of thinking had his compensations. Once he heard Stone say, There's too much laxity in Sheriff Benteen's office anyway. And at another time, I got the police to post a cop out here tonight, John, to keep an eye on you. You're pretty much out in the open at that booth, and if the killer is a maniac. In the general noise and confusion, Bill heard nothing more of what Stone said. He thought it poor taste to dwell on the murder so much, knowing how it had upset Mrs. Linton. It was a good dinner of fried chicken, mashed potatoes, peas, and carrots, assorted home canned relishes and preserves, hot rolls, butter, homemade cake, ice cream, and coffee. After they had eaten, they all went outside where twilight, like blue smoke, had sifted onto the festival grounds. The Lintons went to their respective booths to help with the work of the evening. The Stones made a tour of the midway, and Bill was left to put in his time as he saw fit. He had told Mary Jo he would stay through the evening and drive them home. Within a few minutes, the lights on the midway were turned on, and all the qualities of reality disappeared. Instantly it became a dazzling bit of fairyland, with all its beauty, animation, and color. Then slowly reality returned. The lights seemed less brilliant, and the scars on the wooden countertops, the chip paint, and the dust on the bunting became visible. Bill saw the policeman, a tall, well-built young man, whom Frank Stone had mentioned at the dinner table. He was moving slowly, easily, in and out, through the crowd in front of the country store. Father Kearney saw him, too, and knew why he was there, but felt little ease of mind because of it. He's too young, Father Kearney thought. He'll spend his time strutting about, looking at the pretty girls. Look at the young dandy now, arching his back and throwing out his chest while he talks to Mary Martha O'Brien. Now, if they'd only sent an older man, a man with a sense of responsibility, John might get the protection he needs. Father Kearney seated himself in a chair beside the baked goods booth, directly across from the country store. The freshly baked bread, pies, and cakes gave off a pleasant aroma. He could smell the spiciness of the apple pies and tarts. He nodded, smiled, and talked to different persons, as the crowd moved slowly along in front of the country store, where John Linton, in a farmer's straw hat, was joshing and exhorting the people to stop and look over the items on display. Linton stood to one side of the booth, out of the flow of traffic, near an upended barrel, the top of which was covered with crackers. His good-natured banter brought in many customers. Father Tim walked by, grinned at Father Kearney, and glanced at John Linton. He had hoped the presence of the policeman on the grounds would ease his pastor's mind, but he could see it hadn't. It was a wonderful thing, he thought, the love that existed between those two men. He moved on to feel the air of careless merriment in the crowd, larger and gayer than that of the first evening. There was an exuberance about a finale which an opening, however fresh and new, lacked. A thin, flashily dressed young man moved quickly through the crowd toward Father Tim. You Father Devin? Yes, can I do something for you? The young man shook his head. Then he handed Father Tim an envelope. Lippy Santos sent this to you. He left as quickly as he had come. Father Tim took the envelope, extracted a check for $25. By the light from the dart-throwing booth, he read the note which accompanied the check. Dear Father Devin, there is no string attached to this, and it's not rubber. Just a little offering for your festival fund. Think of me sometimes when you say your prayers. Respectfully, Jules Santos. Father Tim looked from the note to the check, dumbfounded. Yes, he would remember Santos in his prayers, and he'd make a point to run out to see him sometimes. 
With a sudden flash of anger, Father Tim thought of Tedford Wilson. Jules Santos had written, no string attached. After circling the grounds, Bill Devon decided to give his injured leg a rest and walk to the parking lot to sit in his car for a while. He'd come back in a half hour or so and see if Mary Jo would be free to go for a ride. He lay back against the soft cushion of the car seat, relaxed completely. Having come early, his car was in the front row of the parking lot, a good place from which to see the blinking lights of Galton. The night's peace magnified the distant sounds. Bill listened to the buzzing of countless night things coming up from the creek in the valley below. For the past two hours he had been singularly carefree and happy. It had been pleasant respite from the stress of the past few days. The general atmosphere of wholesome fun which pervaded a parish festival had helped him to forget a bit. For a long time he sat there, feeling the closeness of the church and what it meant to him. Past, present, and future were all suspended in a cloudy solution at this time for Bill. He tried to extract the future, wondering what it would hold for him. The familiar heaviness that had been with him all afternoon in the prosecutor's office settled in his chest again, and his heart hammered against his ribs to prove it had been no dream. He knew he really was in a bad spot. He could see the prosecutor's knowing smile, that irritating smile that would not rub off. Bill shook his head and looked out across the sky. The stars burned clear and there was no wind. Tomorrow would be another fine day. He looked idly at the clock on the dashboard. It was ten minutes to nine. He reached into his coat pocket for a pack of cigarettes and put one to his mouth and lighted it. Just as he tossed the burned match on the ground, he saw the flash and heard the report of a gun from out on the hillside in front of him. He threw open the car door, hurriedly got out, disregarding the pain in his knee, and stumbled toward the spot from which the flash had come. He hobbled along painfully through the tall, slippery grass and in and around the confusion of low bushes and scrub trees at the crest of the hill. For an instant he saw the receding form of a man disappear among the trees as he ran toward the creek. He tried to move faster, but his knee gave way, and he stumbled and fell. The pain in his knee burned through him, causing him to moan softly as he slowly got to his feet. He knew he was incapable of further pursuit, so he turned around and started to climb toward the lights on the festival grounds. Breathing heavily, Father Kearney was the first to reach the side of John Linton, bleeding and unconscious on the ground beside the cracker barrel. The blood, bright red in the light from the booth, kept increasing its stain on his white shirt front as Father Kearney begged the gathering crowd to find Dr. Davidson. He was here a minute ago and went off toward the school, someone in the crowd said. Father Kearney knelt beside John Linton, pronouncing the Latin words of final absolution of the church, as he raised his right arm to make the sign of the cross. Looking up, Father Kearney saw Art Kessler in the crowd. Send for an ambulance, Art, and please get someone to run over to the house for my oil stock. With a quick movement, he extracted a clean handkerchief from his pocket, folded it, and bent over to place it on the wound in Linton's chest. When Kessler returned, Father Kearney administered the short form of the sacrament of extreme unction. He would read the complete form of the last rites of the hospital, or on the way when he went with him in the ambulance, he thought, as he raised his hand again to give him the apostolic blessing. Just as he finished the prayers, he felt the gentle pressure of Dr. Davison's shoulder as he crouched beside John Linton. With competent deafness, the doctor's fingers inspected the wound. We'll have to get him to the hospital as quickly as possible. Mary Jo, busy in her booth, heard the shot and saw the crowd converging on the country store. Bewildered and frightened, she stooped under the counter and ran with the crowd. All during the day and evening she had had an uneasy feeling that whoever had murdered Mr. Blake would try again to murder her father. She dashed forward frantically, elbowing people out of her way. When she caught up with Father Tim, also running to the center of the crowd, she asked, "'What's happened? What was that shot?' He turned. I don't know. Then he slowed down to a rapid walk as the crowd separated for him to pass through. Mary Jo followed. When he reached the inner circle and saw the doctor kneeling beside John Linton, Father Tim turned to Mary Jo. She looked ready to faint. Taking her firmly by the arm, he led her out of the crowd. Let's get out of here. Is my father dead? The words came heavily through her sobs. 
I don't think so. Then he reached into the candy booth and pulled out a chair. Wait here a minute, and I'll find out what I can. Mary just slumped into the chair, every nerve in her body gone slack. A large woman, too old and too heavy to fight her way into the crowd, stepped over and laid her hand around Mary Jo's shoulder. There now, dearie, there now. The comfort of the soft warm arm seeped into Mary Jo. She punched the tears from her eyes with her fists. After several minutes she looked up at the woman. Is he dead? I don't think so, dearie. You just sit back and take it easy now. Father Devin will be here in a minute. Here, he's coming now. Father Tim met her eyes, which begged for good news. He fought to keep his face calm, the excitement from his eyes. He's not dead, Mary Jo. Thank God, she murmured softly. Dr. Davidson is with him, and they've sent for an ambulance to take him to the hospital. To the questioning look of the large woman, Father Tim said, Her father, John Linton, was shot. The woman stroked Mary Jo's hair. There now, dearie, everything will be all right. Mary Jo fought to control herself. She must not let herself go completely. She must get to her mother before anyone else told her the news. Bill Devlin struggled, half crouching, up the hill toward the lights from the festival. It was a gentle slope, but with the pain from his knee burning its way into his spine, it was all he could do to remain on his feet. A beam of light struck him in the eyes, blinding him. From out of the darkness came the sharp command, Stand where you are. Put your hands up. Bill winced as he tried to straighten his back and raise his arms. Quick footsteps came toward him. Where's the gun, bud? Bill made no reply. He saw it was the policeman who had been on the grounds that evening. Tense, filled with fear, Bill stood still. Now they would think it was he who had fired the shot. He stepped into another mess. Had the shot been fired at someone on the festival grounds? He looked up the slope and saw he was directly in back of the country store booth where John Linton worked. Had the shot been fired at Linton? Had he been killed? The pain flashed up his leg, almost causing him to fall. Where's the gun? I haven't any gun, Bill replied. He knew the policeman didn't believe him, and wouldn't believe him, if he explained how he happened to be here. But he had to tell him. He couldn't let him think he had fired that shot. With great effort, on account of the pain in his leg, Bill told him how he had seen the flash, and how he had run toward it. Oh, yeah? Who are you? Bill Devon. Captain Bill Devon of the... You! The officer cut in. Look, officer, the guy that fired the shot ran that way. Bill pointed toward the creek. I tried to chase him, and my leg... Oh, yeah, the policeman cut in as he stepped quickly behind Bill, poked him in the back with his revolver, and said, Let's go. No funny stuff now. Bill limped painfully toward the lights and through the gathering crowd of people. At the top of the slope, Bill stopped, unable to take another step. His right leg throbbed with pain. He looked around for something to sit on, but the policeman prodded him in the back. Keep moving. Bill took another step and fell to the ground. He heard a murmur run through the crowd. Something had happened. Was it Linton? Bill lay there helpless, his hair disarranged, the knees of his trousers stained by the earth and grass. What's wrong? Father's Tim voice, low, rounded and filled with sympathy, reached him. Bill turned his head and looked over his shoulder into the eyes of his brother, who was bending over him. Bill nodded toward the policeman. That character thinks I fired a gun down there in the brush. John Linton has been shot, Father Tim said softly. For a moment Bill was completely unnerved. So that was it. Because he'd been down near where the shot had been fired, everyone would think he had shot Mr. Linton. Is it serious? Bill asked. Yes, they're waiting for the ambulance now to take him to the hospital. Father Tim glanced at the policeman, and thought he looked like a man who knew he had a job to do, but hated it. Bill sat up and put his right hand to the side of his knee, as if to ease the pain. I'll have to take you in, the policeman said. A defense of anger welled within Bill. Why? You were the only one down there on the hill who could have fired the shot. They'll decide down at the station whether to book you or not. Bill winced inwardly. He looked away from the officer into Father Tim's eyes, 
full of concern, yet unafraid. Father Tim turned to the policeman. Let's help him over to the rectory. He has a knee injury, wounded in Korea. The officer nodded and slipped his revolver into its holster, put his hands under Bill's arms, and raised him to his feet. With their help, Bill started to walk to the rectory to await the arrival of a police cruiser to take him to jail. It was a long, painful walk. He looked into the future and dreaded the slow progress that would be made when the wheels of the law got moving. There'd be hours, long hours, alone in a cell, lawyers, talks about his defense, talk, talk, talk. And where would it lead to in the end? The penitentiary? He seemed caught in a whirlpool of despair so terrifying that he let out a low, moaning sound. Father Tim looked at him sharply. You all right? Yeah, I'm okay. From far down the highway came the sound of a siren. The ambulance was coming for John Linton. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of Roman Collar Detective by Grace and Harold Johnson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 13 he that hearkeneth to me shall not be confounded. The words of the epistle of the Mass he had just finished, the Mass of the day, August 14th, kept running through the mind of Father Tim as he removed his vestments in the sacristy Thursday morning. Muscles, who had served Mass for Father Tim, walked out of the server's dressing room with his partner, Joey Malone. Be seeing you, Joey. Got to get into the sacristy to see Father Devon. He was out of breath when he came to an abrupt stop at the entrance of the sanctuary, where he had gone when he didn't find Father Tim in the sacristy. Father Tim, wearing his black cassock, was kneeling at the prado to the left of the main altar, his eyes fastened intently on the crucifix high overhead on the wall, and his fingers moving slowly over the beads of his rosary. Without making a sound, Muscles stepped back into the sacristy. He'd wait for Father Tim, and maybe he could do something for him. He was looking awful worried this morning. Father Tim was a swell guy, and so was his brother, Captain Bill, and those old cops that put the captain in jail. It wasn't right, cause anyone with half an eye could see that Captain Bill wouldn't murder anybody. Fifteen minutes later, when the priest left the church to go to the rectory, he found Muscles sitting quietly on the top step at the back door. I thought you'd gone home already, Muscles. No, Father, I was waiting to see you. I'm awful sorry about Captain Bill. But don't worry, Father. Those cops will find out that he didn't do anything. I hope so. Won't you come in and have breakfast? I did eat, Father. Thanks. Mom's not working till noon today, so she got my breakfast before I left. But I'll come in and talk with you, if you want me to. That will be swell, fellow. I don't like to eat alone, and Father Kearney said early mass today. So he ate after that, and Miss Kearney ate with him. A few minutes later, as Muscle sat across the table from Father Tim, sipping a glass of milk, he looked at the priest with a puzzled expression on his small face. You're not eating much, Father. Don't be scared. We'll do something to help the captain. Father Tim smiled. This is a fast day, Muscles. Did you forget? It's the vigil of the Assumption of our Blessed Mother into Heaven. Oh! That's why you're only eating toast and coffee. I was afraid that maybe you were worried sick. Mom gets that way sometimes and can't eat. I'm not as worried now as I was last night. I'm sure everything will be all right after a while. Sure, Father, but we've got to get busy and do something. Sister Anastasia told us last year that God will help us when we ask Him, but that we've got to work at it. That's right, Muscles. And, Father... Remember Captain Bill is going to coach our team. Sure he is, Muscles, and we've got to do everything possible to get him out of jail so he can. A trace of a smile swept across the priest's face. Muscles saw it and was glad. He didn't know what caused it, but he was glad anyway. Father Tim just didn't look natural when he wasn't smiling and happy, and this morning he was pretty serious. Well, who wouldn't be with a bunch of cops acting the way they were? Those cops ought to see that, Muscle said. What's that they ought to see? Father Tim asked. Muscles looked surprised. Oh, I was just thinking about something. What did I say? 
You said the police should see something. What should they see? Why, that Captain Bill was just sitting in his car in the parking lot, like he said, and only went down toward the woods when he saw the gun flash, cause if he'd been down there all the time and fired the shot, where'd he put the gun? He didn't have any gun with him when he came back. That's true, Muscles, and last night the police came out here and looked around for the gun. They'll probably take another look today. It's very important to find the weapon. Muscles fidgeted in his chair and then looked over at Father Tim. I could go down there now and look around, Father. I'd not touch anything if I found it, but just come and tell you. Father Tim looked doubtful. Golly, Father, I know how they do it. I mean, all about how fingerprints are on guns and stuff, and how you shouldn't touch anything. It's in all the comics. Boy, and do those cops know a lot about everything, and do they get their man? Muscle squirmed in his chair and looked hopefully at Father Tim. If you want to, Muscles, run along and see if you can find anything. But be careful. I don't think there'll be any gun around because the killer took it with him. I'll be careful, Muscles called over his shoulder as he hurried out of the dining room door. While he finished drinking his coffee, Father Tim reflected on all that he had to do that morning. Before leaving the rectory, he should call Jerry Laughlin at the news. He'd been wondering about him. Was his head better? If it was, why hadn't he come over to the closing of the festival? Replacing his cup on the saucer, he got up from the table and went into the office. He was relieved when he heard Jerry's voice at the other end of the wire. How's the head, Jerry? Pretty good, but it gave me a rough time last night. Here's something you'll be glad to hear, Father. We just got word from the hospital that Mr. Linton is resting more comfortably. That's great. I hadn't heard anything since Father Kearney came in about six o'clock, after spending the night with him. He said that he had regained consciousness. Mr. Linton will come around all right now. I feel sure, but it certainly was a bad scare. I hear they arrested Bill. Yes, last night. Father Tim told Jerry how Bill had tried to chase the assailant, had fallen, and again placed himself in a very suspicious-looking situation. Did they book him? I don't know. I suppose so. But they haven't found the gun yet. I don't see how they can book him if they haven't the weapon. I don't know the legal angles, Jerry, but I plan to go over to the jail to see him, just as soon as I can count and bank the proceeds from last night. I must get at it immediately, too. Call me if you hear anything. Glad your head's better. Thanks, Father. I'll keep you posted. After hanging up, Father Tim closed the office door so Miss Kearney wouldn't disturb him. It would take quite a while to check the returns from the booths, and he wanted to do it as quickly as possible. Again his thoughts went back to the night before. He pictured in his mind the commotion following the shooting of Mr. Linton. It had cast a shadow over the festivities, and gradually the grounds had emptied of everyone except the workers in the various booths. Even they quickly packed the remaining articles, talking over with the chairman what to do with anything perishable, checked out, and left for home. Several of the men had loaded their cars with baked goods, which were unsold, also the contents of the hot dog and hamburger stands, and had taken them to the hospital and the orphan's home at the edge of town. By ten o'clock the school grounds were deserted, the booths standing gaunt in their nakedness. Father Tim could still see the agonizing look in his brother's eyes, as he had asked him to call Aunt Martha and tell her what had happened. Bill must have felt awful in front of all those people. He looked at his wristwatch. He'd better stop thinking about last night and count the money faster so he could get to the bank and over to see Bill before lunchtime. An hour later, as he was leaving the bank, after making the deposit, he met Jerry Laughlin. Just came from the jail, Father. They haven't booked Bill yet, and he's plenty sore. Can't say as I blame him. They haven't found the gun, either. I know, Father Tim said. They hadn't found it up to twenty minutes ago when I left the rectory although there were two policemen combing the grounds. Muscles was on the prowl, too. Jerry laughed. Quite a kid. Yes, and he's very upset over Bill. He wanted to hunt for the gun, so I gave him permission to go out and look around. If anyone finds it, he will, and if he gives up, there's no gun there. You'd better get over to see Bill, Father. He's the most abrasive product they've ever had in that jail. Boy, is he rough on them. He's thundering and crackling so they can't even think. 
He's demanding that they book him or let him out. Bill can be volatile, but I'm afraid it won't do him any good. In fact, it could do him harm. I'm going over right away to see him. Just one thing before you go, Father. Early this morning, as I was entering the news office, I met Wilson of the Galton Trust. He'd been in to see Frank Stone. He stopped me and asked if I was a member of St. Mary's Parish, and if I knew you real well. I said sure to both questions. Then he asked me if you were one to do a lot of loose talking. I grinned at that, Father, and said, Heck no, Father Devon's first cousin to a clam. What's it all about, Father? Give. Father Tim's eyes took on a set expression. There's nothing to give, Jerry. I've only talked with Mr. Wilson a few times in the thirteen months I've been here in Galton. Something's worrying him, Father. At least he seemed relieved when I told him you didn't do much talking. What you got on him, Father? Father Tim looked out across the street at the cars moving slowly as they approached the intersection. I don't know much about the man, so I'd rather not talk about him, Jerry. I'll have to run now if I'm to get in to see Bill before lunch. Father Tim walked up the worn steps of the red brick building, toward an open door on which were lettered the words, Police Station. He stepped inside, walked across the bare, unvarnished floor, toward a desk at which a police sergeant sat working a crossword puzzle. They exchanged greetings and agreed that it looked like rain. Then Father Tim asked, May I see my brother, Captain Devon? Sure, Father, you bet you can. The officer gave Father Tim a hopeful look. See if you can get him to quiet down. This is a small jail, and he can be heard all over the place. He's making life miserable for me. I'll be glad when he's either let out or booked and sent over to Crescent City to the county jail. He's got a lag wound that has become very painful in the past few days. Machine gun wound. He's just back from Korea. That and the misfortune of being questioned about the murder of Samuel Blake, and now locked up for the shooting of John Linton, has him greatly upset. Upset's not the word, Father. He's downright sore. Get him to see it's not my fault he's here. I'm just doing my job. I'll do my best, Sergeant. Father Tim's thoughts were a confused jumble as he walked down the short corridor on each side of which opened two doors, heavily barred. In the second on the left, he could see Bill sitting, dejected, forlorn, on the side of a single cot, pushed against the wall. A knot of anxiety wrenched his heart with a feeling as sharp as pain when he heard the key grate in the lock and saw the heavy iron door open to allow him to enter. Could this really be his brother behind a locked and barred door? Hello, Bill. Hi, Tim. Father Tim stood for a moment, curiously shaken. He knew he should say something, but what was there to say? The misery in Bill's eyes cut through him. The door clanged behind him, steel against steel, and the key turned in the lock again. Well, they've got me where they want me, Tim, and of all the crummy dumps, this takes the prize. Cockroaches all over the place. How's Mr. Linton? The last word I had, he's conscious and resting comfortably. God willing, he'll make it. Bill nodded. A little silence followed. Father Tim looked at his brother uncertainly. He saw the bunched cheek muscles and the tight lips in Bill's angry face. He'd have to get him out of this mood. But how? Sympathy wouldn't do it. Before he could say anything, Bill questioned. Any news of the gun? Not yet, Bill. Then the knuckleheads ought to see that I couldn't have done it. That's what Muscle said this morning. Yeah, and in the meantime, I'm supposed to be enjoying myself here. By the way, how are the meals in this hotel? I'd take K-rations any day. Then, with a quick movement, Bill looked at his brother. Got any money with you? A little. Why? Got five bucks? Yes, I believe so. Then, on your way home, drop into the Hilton Hotel and have them send me some food. Tell them, lunch this noon, dinner tonight. Those characters took everything away from me last night, even my wallet, and they put it all in a nice little envelope for safekeeping. How about having your dinner sent in, but eating your lunch here? This is a fast day, pal, the vigil of the Assumption, and I'm sure the menu this noon won't exceed what the church allows. Father Tim grinned. Okay, Tim, but tell them to make the dinner a good one. My fish choices are boiled salmon steak, 
fried brook trout, baked white. Easy, Bill, you're making me hungry. How about my car, Tim? Is it still in the parking lot? Yes. Well, if it's as cloudy outside as it is in here, you better get my keys from the desk sergeant and run it into the garage. The top's down. I'll do that as soon as I get home. It does look like rain. Father Tim looked at Bill, and then at the cot on which they were seated. Why don't you stretch out and relax? I've got to get going now. Have a busy day, confessions this afternoon, and evening before the holy day. Anything you want besides your dinner? Yes, to get out of here. Bill's mouth softened, and it made Father Tim feel good to see a trace of a smile. Yes, I know, habeas corpus. I thought of it this morning, but on talking it over with Father Kearney, he's counseled against the use of it. What the heck? He's not the one who has to stay here. I know, Bill, but there's sound reasoning behind it. We know that you are innocent, and that no gun will be found, and without it, they'll probably turn you loose. Father was sure you had been brought in only for questioning, but if they thought you were seeking a writ, they might go ahead and book you right away. The reasoning's all right, but the quarters are still pretty cramped. The bed's lumpy and the food lousy. From the retort, Father Tim could see that Bill was getting back some of his old spirit. You can put up with it a few more hours. Father Kearney is sure they'll release you by night, if they haven't found the gun. He's no lawyer, but he's seen a lot of life. I trust his judgment. Okay, Tim, but don't forget to have them send me in a good dinner, if I'm not out by then. I'll not forget, Bill. Behave yourself now for the next few hours, and don't try to bend the bars out of shape. Bill grinned, stretched out on the cot, and kicked off his shoes. Be seeing you out in the great open spaces soon, I hope. Not smiling, but inwardly calm over Bill's apparent resignation to his present predicament, Father Tim left the police station and walked toward his car. Bill will be all right now for a while. End of Chapter 13 Chapter 14 of Roman Color Detective by Grace and Harold Johnson. The Slipperfox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 14. At 4.30 that afternoon, confessions over, Father Tim started to leave the church. He got as far as the side door, where he stopped in the open doorway to watch a summer storm collect into black crested clouds before the first large drops of rain fell. For ten minutes a heavy downpour kept him in the doorway. He watched the rain wash down the hot, steaming cars in the parking lot. It was a good thing he'd put Bill's car in the garage when he got back from town. Halfway to the rectory, Father Tim saw muscles coming up the driveway, his clothes wet but a grin on his face. He stopped and waited for him. Hi, Father. Hello, muscles. Fall in the river? The grin faded. No, Father, it rained. That's right, it did. Come into the rectory and get out of those wet clothes before you catch cold. All right, Father, Muscle said, quickly falling in beside him. I found the shell, and the cop said it must be the one from the gun that shot Mr. Linton, and he picked it up with a little stick in case there was fingerprints on it. You weren't home, so I couldn't tell you about it. Will they let Captain Bill go now? I don't know, but I suppose so. It was a thirty thirty rifle shell, Father. The cop said so. The cops wouldn't know Bill didn't have a rifle like that. I asked him. What did you ask him, Muscles? I asked him if he thought Captain Bill had a gun like that. What did the policeman say? He looked at me kind of funny-like and said, Maybe you got something there, kid. If he did have a gun down there, he was a magician the way it disappeared. Then I asked him if they let Captain Bill out now, and he said he didn't know. He said all he did was bring him in and lock him up. When they reached the rectory, Father Tim opened the door to the sunroom with his left hand, while with his right he propelled Muscles up the two steps ahead of him. You first, Muscles. Captain Bill! Muscles shouted, and ran into the room. Bill Devon was seated in an armchair, grinning at their surprise. How long have you been here? Father Tim asked. About an hour. The cops found a shell from a thirty thirty rifle, and decided that unless I'd eaten the thing, there was no time for me to dispose of it except in the creek, and they dragged it in vain. Is that a load off my mind? The cops didn't find the shell, Captain Bill. I did, Muscle said proudly. I knew they'd need help. Bill looked at Father Tim. 
Get my car put away before that downpour? It's in the garage. Good. How about my keys, and I'll drive home to Aunt Martha's for dinner. I canceled the hotel's curb service and picked up your five bucks. Here it is. Thanks for the loan. I'll get your keys, Father Tim said, and left the room. Muscles looked up at Bill. If tomorrow wasn't a holy day, maybe we could start football practice. Bill rubbed his fingers affectionately in the youngster's wet hair. But it is a holy day, so we'll start Monday. How's that? It will give me time to think up some good trick plays. You said you'd show us Notre Dame plays. That's right, I did. They'll be a lot better than anything I could think up. Father Tim came in and handed Bill the keys to his car. Bill rose and winked at Father Tim. I think you've lost a coaching job. And thanks, Muscles, for finding that shell. Otherwise, I'd still be sitting down there in jail. Be seeing you tonight, Tim. I have confessions until nine. Okay, I'll see you after that. Father Tim led Muscles down the hall and up the stairs to the bathroom. Take a shower while I look around for something for you to wear. I'll have Miss Kearney put your wet things in the clothes dryer. They'll be dry by the time you're ready to go home. We can't put these tennis shoes in, so you'll have to go barefoot. Father Tim was still smiling over Miss Kearney's remark when he came back upstairs. Her reaction to the clothes drying was, It'd be much simpler for us to adopt the kid but her smile as she walked away with a wet bundle belied the words. He dressed muscles in a pair of his own white shorts, folded in generously, and held with safety pins, and a gray blue sweatshirt which reached to his knees. They decided, for sartorial perfection, to tuck the shirt into the shorts. You're built like a snake, muscles. No hips. That's what Mom says. Say, Father, I was in the drugstore looking at comics this afternoon because it looked like it was going to rain. I was sitting on the floor by the magazine stand, so I guess he didn't see me. Who didn't see you? The guy that came in and used the telephone. You hear a lot of stuff you shouldn't on that phone. Anyway, it's not nice to listen to what other people talk about when they don't know you are around. But I'm not going to get up and go outside just because they want to use the phone. I never get any comics read. If what they got to say is so private, they should go to the one in the bowling alley. That's in a phone booth. All right, Muscles, maybe you're right. I see your point. Yes, Father. But this guy was talking about Mr. Linton. He was talking to Lippy Santos. How did you know? Well, Father, when he first started, he said, That you, Santos? And then later he got sort of mad and said, I thought you were going to meet me in front of the bowling alley. Then after he listened a minute, he said, Okay, Lippy. All right, what else did he say? He said, I won't need that guy now that Linton's in the hospital. Stone won't play tonight. Then Lippy talked, and then this guy said, Maybe in a couple of weeks, if Linton doesn't die. Then after Lippy talked again, this guy said, Sure, I'll pay his expenses for this trip. Who does he think he is, asking that much? The only card shark in the country. Then Lippy talked some more again, and the guy said, Okay, take care of him. I'll see that you get repaid. Lippy must have said something funny then, because the guy laughed and said, Who, Stone? He won't last much longer. He's practically out in the street. Be there now if it weren't for me. Those teachers we've been getting for him are expensive. Muscles looked questioningly at Father Tim. Funny things to say about Mr. Linton and Mr. Stone. What do they mean? I don't know, Father Tim says slowly. I don't know. I wish I did. Who was this man? Have you ever seen him around before? Oh, sure, lots of times, but I didn't know who he was, so I asked Mr. Franklin. He said the guy was Mr. Wilson, president of the bank. Muscles knew that what he had just told Father Tim was important from the look on his face. He stood silent, rubbing his hand idly up and down his jaw. Then he turned to Muscles. Let's go down to dinner. I'm hungry. Father Kearney was already seated at the table when they entered the dining room. We have a dinner guest, Father Tim said. Father Kearney smiled. Yes, I know. Mary told me. Then, turning to Muscles, he said, Is that thing you're wearing the latest informal dinner jackets? No, Father Kearney. I got wet. The first half of the dinner was eaten in almost complete silence. Father Tim could see that Father Kearney was still worried about John Linton, despite the favorable reports from the hospital. 
From outside came the shrill, squeaky chatter of starlings fighting over the ripening fruit in the wild cherry trees. But the noise had little effect on the heavy silence in the room. Father Kearney's spoon clicked against his coffee cup. The sound was loud and intruding. It seemed to startle him and break his chain of thoughts. He looked from his sister to Father Tim. I was just thinking how John Linton measured up to the code of the Greeks. They contended that a man to have complete virtue must have twelve qualities, namely, ambition, gentleness, truthfulness, magnificence, generosity, magnanimity, reverence, justice, prudence, wit, courage, and a certain degree of charm. John measures up well. Muscles sat entranced by the smooth, sure flow of words. Point by point, Father Kearney developed his subject. He had reached courage. Father Tim and Muscles were finished with their meal, and Miss Kearney was just starting on her second cup of coffee when the doorbell rang. Father Tim went to the door. The grim, tired face of Sheriff Benteen looked in at him through the screen. Evening, Father. I'd like to see you a few minutes. Before his hand could reach the doorknob, Benteen had pushed open the door and stepped inside. Guess this is a bad hour to bother you, but it can't be helped. I'm on my way back to Crescent City, and figured I'd better stop here on the way. Perfectly all right, Sheriff, Father Tim said. We just finished dinner. Benteen's eyes glanced around the vestibule, then settled on Father Tim. Does your brother own a thirty thirty rifle? A startled look appeared in the priest's eyes. The sheriff had probably heard that Bill had been released by the city police, so now he was going to take over. Wouldn't they ever let Bill alone? Not to my knowledge. If he did have a rifle, it would probably be at her aunt's, Mrs. McCarthy. She lives across the highway from the Lintons. I've seen her. She says your brother hasn't brought any guns into her house, and that she never owned one. Father Tim smiled. That's your answer, then. The sheriff gave him an indifferent nod. Won't you come into the office and sit down? You'd be more comfortable. Benteen shook his head. I'm in a hurry. How about showing me where John Linton was standing when he was shot, and where that thirty thirty shell was found? If you're thinking that Bill had anything to do with John Linton being shot, you're mistaken. The city police have investigated my brother's account of what happened and released him this afternoon. I know, I know, Benteen said, but how about showing me around? I can't show you where the shell was found, because I don't know, but if you'll excuse me a minute, I'll ask the boy who found it, if he'll show you. He explained how Muscles had got wet in the downpour before dinner and had been waiting on his clothes to get dried. In a few minutes he returned alone, and said that Muscles would be glad to show him as soon as he was dressed. While waiting for Muscles, Father Tim led the way across the parking lot, and pointed out where Bill had been sitting in his parked car, and also the place where Linton had been standing when shot. The sheriff looked soberly across the valley, took off his straw hat, and scratched his head. Your brother seems to have the knack of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Father Tim smiled. It seems that way. But if you knew him, you wouldn't be surprised. He's impulsive, and he's fearless. Benteen gave Father Tim a doubtful look, and continued his survey of the grounds. Within a few minutes, Muscles joined them, his clothes dry but wrinkled. Miss Gurney said she'd have ironed him, if there'd been time, but she didn't want to keep Mr. Benteen waiting. The sheriff cleared his throat. Supposing now, Sonny, that you show me where you found the shell. Muscles pointed down the hillside toward the right. Benteen nodded and looked at Father Tim. Will you stand on the spot where Linton was standing while I go down the hill? I'd like to figure out where the shot was fired from. Certainly, Father Tim replied, and walked about fifteen feet back from the edge of the long grass and took his position. Come on, Sonny, we'll go straight down from here. The sheriff stepped into the long grass, getting the cuffs of his trousers wet. When he had gone about a hundred feet down the slope, he stopped before a large oak tree. Turning to Muscles, he said, This was probably where he was when he fired the shot, almost a straight line up the hill. Now where did you find the shell? Muscles took the lead through the scrub trees and bushes. He stopped at an old rail fence, rotted and falling apart. He climbed over it and then stopped. I found it right here, right on this spot, Sheriff. He pointed to the ground. Benteen looked up toward Father Tim, then toward the west. His eyes had a far-reaching expression in them. He seemed to be seeing something a long way off. He ran this far, he said, before he stopped to pump another cartridge into the chamber. 
He was afraid he might meet up with someone on the way home. If he had, there'd been another murder. His eyes were hard as for a long moment he gazed in the direction of the McCarthy home, unseen behind the trees in the Linton yard. Benteen looked down at his feet, then at muscles. Let's get out of here. The bottoms of my pants are getting soaked, and I've got to get back to Crescent City. The sun, which had been behind a cloud, came out, full of creative heat. From the bottom land along the creek came the rank odor of decayed matter. Muscle's face wore a worried frown as he followed the sheriff up to where Father Tim was standing. He knew who the sheriff had been talking about while he stood looking beyond the trees toward the McCarthy home. He'd been talking about Captain Bill. Was he going to arrest him now and take him to Crescent City? Was that why he was in such a hurry? Muscles didn't say anything when he reached Father Tim, but walked solemnly beside him as they retraced their steps to the rectory. They watched silently as Benteen got into his car and drove off toward Crescent City. "'Is he going to arrest Captain Bill, Father? He talked all the time down there like he thought Captain Bill had shot Mr. Linton. He didn't say any name, just kept saying he. But that's who he was thinking about.' Father Tim forced a smile. I don't know what Sheriff Benteen has on his mind, but if you see Captain Bill, don't mention that the sheriff was here. Now I'd better get ready to go over to church to hear confessions, and you'd better get on home before your mother gets worried. Be seeing you, muscles. Good night, Father. The warm, humid air of the night felt fresh and cool against Father Tim's face after two hours in the stuffy confessional. He paused for a moment as he left the church to look at the stars, brilliant against the darkened sky, far beyond a few scattered clouds. There came to his mind a picture he had once seen, a picture done in all shades of blue, of a shepherd standing watch over his flock with the stars looking down on him. How appropriately it had been titled, When I Consider Thy Heavens, and how beautifully the artist had captured the spirit of the psalms. He walked slowly, reveling in the coolness, the freshness of the soft breeze coming up from the creek, the confessional certainly had been a Turkish bath tonight. He'd have to take a quick shower and put on some dry clothes before he did anything else. Twenty minutes later, when he came downstairs, he found Bill seated in the reception room. How'd it go tonight? Bill said. Rugged. It was terribly hot. Bill wrinkled his nose. What stinks in here? Father Tim laughed. I guess Miss Kearney chased a mosquito with a DDT bomb. They come up from the creek, especially after a rain. Bill sat for a moment as if recalling the past. Then he sniffed again at the heavy, Swedish odor. You know, Tim, the guy that killed Blake and held me up last Monday night smelled the same way. I got a good whiff of it when he reached out and held the pistol in front of me. Father Tim took a deep breath. He'd encountered that same odor that night. But when and where? Maybe Miss Kearney had been using it to keep out moths, but he and Bill hadn't lingered long in the house that evening. They had gone directly outside to the festival grounds. Bill's voice cut in on his thoughts. Boy, oh boy, it feels good to be out of that dump of a jail and out from under suspicion. Out from under suspicion, Father Tim thought. Should he prepare Bill for what might be in store for him? Should he tell him of Benteen's visit? Better not. Give him a few hours free from worry. What you so gloomy looking about? Bill asked. You think they still suspect me? I was just wondering if Benteen had dropped the idea that you killed Blake. Bill laughed harshly. That guy, he was over and asked Aunt Martha if I owned a thirty thirty rifle, and found out that I didn't. So what else can he think now? They know, or must know, that the guy who killed Blake, cropped Jerry on the head, and wounded Linton, is one and the same guy. I'm sure they are satisfied that I didn't shoot Mr. Linton, so it follows I'm not Blake's murderer. Father Tim forced a smile. I hope you're right. Bill laughed. Of course I'm right. I'm free as the wind now. But why did all this have to happen to me? Father Tim gave Bill a look full of affection. I can't answer that fully, Bill. God's ways seem strange to us at times, but he plans well and arranges everything for the best. You've gained something from the experiences of this week. Bill looked up, a doubtful expression in his eyes. Maybe, Tim, but I wouldn't know what. They talked on for another hour. For Bill, it was one of the few happy hours since he arrived in Galton a week ago. After Bill left, Father Tim went up to his room. He was tired physically, 
but his mind was racing with a number of unanswerable questions. He wished he knew how and what Sheriff Benteen was planning after his exploration of the church grounds. Poor Bill! He seemed to think that he was entirely free now. Maybe he should have warned him, told him of Benteen's visit, so that the sheriff's next stroke wouldn't be too much of a surprise. As he undressed, he continued to mull over the conflicting angles of Bill's problem. It led him nowhere. He looked at his wristwatch. It was 11.30. Reaching out onto the small table beside his bed, he picked up a book. He'd read for a while and relax. Even after he stopped reading and snapped off a light, he lay in the darkness. His eyes closed, but his mind going over again the happenings of the night that Sam Blake was murdered. Queer how much a man forgot about things that had happened only such a short time before. It was like trying to rebuild a newsreel from chopped-up, raggy-edged film. Over and over again he ran through the events of that fatal night. And then, with the suddenness that lights come on after a power shortage during a storm, the thing he was after came to him. The thought did odd things to his pulses, causing him to breathe heavily. He had it. Now he knew who had killed Sam Blake who had attacked Jerry Laughlin, and who had shot John Linton. But why had he done it? And how could he, an inexperienced parish assistant, prove it? Long into the night, his mind dug up trifling bits of evidence, which, when placed all together, could mean a great deal. But one thing stood out clear in his mind. He would talk the whole matter over with Father Kearney as soon as possible in the morning. He needed the counsel of his pastor's years of labor among men. Then the next step was to see and talk to Joel Santos. End of chapter 14「Fifteen of Roman Color Detective by Grace and Harold Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 15 the morning sun was an hour from noon when Father Tim drove out to the sportsmen's club the next day to see the Bisantos. There were wisps of clouds in the sky, the mere shreds, all seemingly going in every direction, as if what wind there was in the high air couldn't settle down and go one way. When he entered the club, the bartender was leaning over the bar, the same as the first time. Two men were in a side booth, and Santos was at the table in the rear, working with his stack of small slips of paper. Was this place always like this? Father Tim wondered. It was like entering a wax museum. However, the bartender showed signs of life. He nodded, and then looked toward Lippy Santos. On seeing the priest, Santos pushed the slips of paper against the wall, and came forward with his hand outstretched. Hello, Father Devin. Glad to see you. After they had shaken hands, Santos asked, A drink, Father? It's a hot day. Come and sit down. Thank you, Mr. Santos. I'd rather not. I just dropped by to speak with you a few minutes. Won't you come outside and sit in my car? Okay, Father. It's a hot day. How about a drink out there? Thank you. A glass of ginger ale will be refreshing. Turning to the bartender, Santos said, Bring out two ginger ales. Put a slug in mine. They walked slowly to the car, parked in the shade of a large elm tree, which towered over the building. When they were seated, Father Tim said, I dropped in to thank you for the check, Mr. Santos. It was a generous thing you did. That's okay. You're doing a good job over there with the kids, and I'm glad to help a bit. Sounds funny hearing someone call me Mr. Everybody calls me Lippy. Why? That's a funny thing, too. They used to call me Gabby, because I don't talk much. Less you say, the less you got to take back, I always figured. When you're in my business, you got to mean what you say. One day, about ten years ago, a lawyer in court called me Lippy. The boys got a big charge out of that, so I've been Lippy ever since. Father Tim put his hands on the steering wheel in a relaxed position and looked over at Santos. I appreciate your thinking about the festival and the gift you gave us. Would you be interested in attending services at St. Mary's sometime? Santos laughed. If I ever walked into your church and sat down, everyone there would get up and walk out. I'd be the only customer left for you to preach to. Why do you think that? I've got a pretty bad reputation. Reputation is only what people think you are. There are many men of good reputation who are really scoundrels, but no one has found them out. It's what you are at heart that counts. 
and you wouldn't have sent that check and said we are doing a good job with the kids if you didn't have a good heart. And you're wrong about people getting up and leaving the church. Everyone there knows that there are few saints. We are all human, all sinners. That is why we have the confessional. A man can go before Christ with a repentant heart and have his sins forgiven. They all know that. No, they wouldn't leave. They'd be glad to see you. The black sheep? Why put it that way? Why not the prodigal son? Who's he? Father Tim explained the parable. Never heard that one, Santos said. I only went to church a few times when I was a kid with my mother. We go to the one nearest the hotel in whatever town we were. Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, it made no difference. The bartender came out with the two glasses of ginger ale. You traveled a lot when you were young? Sure, there was pride in Lippy's voice. My father was Santos the Great, a real magician. He was one of the best with cards. Could do anything with them, but make him talk. He drilled me, too. Wanted me to be a magician, but I didn't like it. Why? Santos took a drink. Oh, doing the tricks was okay. I could do them, but you have to talk too much. You know, the patter you have to spiel while doing the tricks. Just the tricks without the patter makes the show a flop. I found I could use the same sleight of hand playing cards and still make money, and I didn't have to gab all the time while doing it. You mean cheating? Santos finished his glass in one gulp. You might call it that. I call it skill. The other guy's got the same chance and can get my dough, if he's better than I am. It's only cheating if you're caught. Father Tim took a drink of ginger ale and looked out across the parking lot to the highway. He marveled at the philosophy of Santos. He'd make it a point to tell Father Kearney. It would interest him. Could a man like this be brought to Christ? Why not? Santos slid to the edge of the seat. I'll go and get a deck of cards and show you what I mean. He was back in a few minutes with a new deck, broke the seal, shuffled them, and for fifteen minutes gave Father Tim a fascinating, instructive demonstration of finger dexterity. Each time Father Tim got the low cards, Santos the high ones. Now, so far I've been using an unmarked deck, Father, and I could lose. Say, I had three aces, three of a kind, but I might have dealt the other guy a low straight. But the chances are one to two fifty. That I didn't. Or maybe I have four of a kind, I ones. Still, I couldn't lose, but the odds are one to over four thousand that I wouldn't. Some smart guy figured those odds out. I remember him. I'm always ahead in the end with odds like that. If I used a marked deck, the other guy'd never have a chance. Father Tim sipped at his ginger ale. A little friend of mine overheard a one-sided conversation between Mr. Wilson and you. He told me about it because he didn't understand it, and frankly, neither did I. Wilson mentioned Mr. Linton and Mr. Stone and card sharks and expensive teachers. Care to enlighten me on that? I'm interested because Mr. Linton's name was mentioned. Lippy's eyes hardened. Who's your friend? Does it matter? Santos shrugged his shoulders. I guess not. Then a faint smile appeared. Muscles? Father Tim nodded. You've got a first-class stoolie there, Father. That kid hears and sees a lot. Smart, too. I'm afraid he hears and sees much that he shouldn't. Santos frowned. Maybe, but sometimes it's better to see it when you're young. Then you won't be a sucker when you grow up. But it might lead him on the wrong path. If you're worrying about muscles, forget it. He's smart, and with you watching over him, he'll be all right. I'll give him a kick in the pants once in a while, just for good measure. Father Tim smiled. Do that but you didn't answer my question. Santos let his right hand run idly over the radio buttons on the dashboard. Then he looked over at Father Tim. There's a word called ethics, Father. You got yours, and I got mine. Then he smiled. I ain't talking. No hard feelings? Father Tim returned the smile. No hard feelings. Santos stepped out onto the ground, and then leaned on the car door. Come again, Father. I will, and drop over to see me. Santo shook his head. No, you better come here. It was one thirty that afternoon when Lippy Santos, Big Dutch, and Rocky walked out into the heat of the day from the central bowling alley. Lippy saw Muscles O'Rourke standing in front of the Franklin drug store, looking at the window display. Putting his hand out in front of Rocky and Big Dutch, he said, Wait here a minute. 
Muscles turned from the store window when Libby approached. Hi, Mr. Santos. Hi yourself, kid. I want to talk to you. Yes, sir. You're a stoolie for Father Devon out at St. Mary's? Fear crept through Muscles, a weakening fear. He knew what happened to stoolies. He'd read about them in the comics. His mouth was so dry he could hardly say, No, sir. You know what a stoolie is? Yes, sir, an informer. Darn if the kid ain't smart. Uses big words, too. Then why did you tell Father Devon about that phone call Wilson made to me? Muscles wanted to turn and run, but he could never run far enough to get away from Santos, Big Dutch and Rocky. Because I didn't know what he meant by what he said. Stuff like those teachers being expensive. I thought teachers didn't make much money. Santos reached out and rubbed his well-cupped hand in Muscles' hair. There was affection in the touch. Muscles felt better, much better. Kid, on one of these days, you're going to be a man with money in your pocket. Maybe you want to play a little cards with your pals, and that's okay. Maybe you want to back up your cards with a little cash, and that's okay, too. Then one day a pal calls up and asks you to come over to his place for a game of cards, and you say you'd go. Then he says to bring along a big chunk of dough and make the game interesting. What are you going to do? Muscles thought the question over for a minute. Well, if he was a good friend and I had a lot of money, maybe I'd say I'd do it. Okay, now your pal says he forgot to tell you, but a real good friend of his from Pittsburgh was visiting him, and would it be okay if he sat in the game too? Now what are you going to say? Okay, I guess, if he's a friend of... It ain't okay, Muscles, Santos cut in. Your pal might be running in a teacher on you, a guy that could do more kinds of tricks with cards than you could think of, and he'd win all your money away from you. Then, in a few days, your pal will call up and ask if you'd like a chance to win your money back. So you go again. This time he's got a friend from Detroit. Pretty soon you're a skinned rabbit, and your pal forgets he ever knew you. See what I mean? Yes, Mr. Santos. That's expensive education, Santos laughed loudly. Adult education. Then he looked down seriously at Muscles. Kid, never play cards with a stranger, and stick close to Father Devon. Do what he tells you, and the next time you see him, tell him I gave you a kick in the pants. But you didn't. You tell him, or I'll really give you one the next time I see you. Muscles watched Santos walk away and join Rocky and Big Dutch. He sure was a funny guy, and to tell him to say to Father Tim that he kicked him when he hadn't at all, that sure was funny. But he'd tell Father Tim for sure. He wasn't fooling around with Mr. Santos, and he'd tell Father Tim what he'd said about playing cards, too, and about the teachers. End of chapter 15、chapter、of Roman Colored Detective By Grace and Harold Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 16 While Jules Santos talked to Muscles in front of the drug store, Father Tim parked his car in the rear of Galton's yellow brick hospital. The strong antiseptic odor struck him forcibly as he entered by way of the ambulance door. He was no stranger there. He knew his way around, for he had come through that entrance to the emergency room many times. At odd hours of the day and night during the past thirteen months. It was in the emergency room that he had administered the sacrament of extreme unction for the first time as a newly ordained priest. He remembered it all vividly as he climbed the back stairway to the second floor and walked directly to John Linton's private room. Come right in, Father, Linton called from his bed as he saw him peeking around the half open door. John Linton looked stronger than he was. He stretched out his hand and smiled in greeting. You're looking fine, Mr. Linton, Father Tim said. But Father Kearney warned me not to let you talk too much. We've got to conserve that strength of yours so you'll make a speedy recovery. Father Kearney is watching over me even when he isn't here, eh? That's right. I brought a book along to read a bit aloud to you. Thought we'd both enjoy it, and it would be more relaxing for you than talking. That was thoughtful of you, Father. Father Tim pulled a chair to the right side of the bed. So it would be easy for Mr. Linton to watch him as he read. He had been reading for about twenty minutes when Mary Jo and Jerry Laughlin entered the room. Keep right on, Father, Mary Jo said. We'll enjoy listening, too. 
After finishing the selection he was reading, Father Tim stood up. I'll leave you with Mary Jo now, Mr. Linton. Then turning to her, he said, May I steal Jerry away from you for a few minutes? I want to get some first-class advice. How about going out in the sunroom with me, Jerry? Sure, Father. I won't be back, Mr. Linton, so I'll say goodbye for this time and give you my blessing. He raised his right hand and made the sign of the cross as he recited the church's prayer of blessing for the sick. John Linton blessed himself and smiled contentedly at Father Tim. Take care of yourself now, and I'll see you in a day or two. Then Father Tim joined Jerry, who had walked into the corridor. When they reached the sunroom, they found it occupied, so they went out on the landing of the back stairs. Jerry put a shoulder point against the wall, took out a pipe, filled it, tamped it, and put a match to it. He looked questioningly at Father Tim. What do you want to know, Father? Father Tim smiled. Just a bit about ballistics, criminal law, and... Wait a minute, Father. I'm only a reporter. A smart one, though, Jerry. Would a person owning a thirty thirty rifle have to register it? Not in Ohio, Father. There's no law in this state that requires the registration of firearms. Some municipalities require it, but Galton doesn't. The only thing the state requires is the registration of submachine guns and stuff like that. Father Tim stood in deep thought for a long moment. Supposing the rifle was found that fired the bullet at Mr. Linton, would it be possible to prove it was the same gun, by comparing the shell muscles found with another fired as a test? I know they do it when they find the bullet, but can it be done with only the shell? Oh, sure. That's routine stuff now with the ballistic experts. They've done it in a number of cases and got convictions on it, too. Could they make those tests in Crescent City? No, Father. They either use the FBI, the Ohio Traveling Crime Laboratory, or Cleveland's Crime Lab. They all give good, quick service. Just for your information, the local police asked the FBI for a fingerprint report one day, a couple of weeks back, and they had the report here, or rather at Crescent City, within six hours. That's real service. Yes, it is. I don't see how they can do it. Jerry looked at Father Tim suspiciously. Why was he asking these questions? Did he know something? What could he know that wasn't already known to everyone? When could he have picked up his information? Why, just yesterday, he spent half the day in the confessional, did the bookkeeping on the festival, and a dozen other jobs. How could he have found out information that a reporter couldn't? You know something, don't you, Father? Come on, give. There's nothing to give yet, Jerry. When the story does break, I think you'll be right in the middle of it. Good. That's the way I like it. Father Tim looked down through the window at the landing between the first and second floor. An intern, a stethoscope dangling from his white coat pocket, was talking earnestly with a pretty nurse. Let's suppose for a minute, the priest went on, that I felt sure I knew who had murdered Mr. Blake, knocked you out, and shot Mr. Linton. Now this is not much more than a feeling, let's say, borne out by a few almost intangible facts that point to one party. Each little fact alone means nothing but taken together they do seem to point to one man as the murderer. What can I do? Have you got the motive figured out? No, not yet. That point bothers me greatly, and I need the rifle that fired the shot which wounded Mr. Linton. Jerry laughed. For a minute I thought you had something, but if you have no motive and no rifle, you haven't got much of a suspect. The cops could use that rifle, too. Then they'd have a case. That's true, Jerry. Have the police checked on people in the vicinity who have purchased a thirty thirty rifle during the past few years? Yes, I talked to Officer Helm about that. He said they had, but it produced no results. The trouble is, someone could have moved into town with a thirty thirty they bought somewhere else. It might have been purchased either new or second hand. To find that rifle is like looking for the proverbial needle. Father Tim frowned and stood thinking. Then he asked, what could be done if it could be pointed out that in all probability a certain man had committed the crime and undoubtedly had the rifle hidden in his house? You could get a warrant for his arrest, Jerry replied promptly. The law is that if a felony has actually been committed, you can get a warrant for the arrest of any person you believe did the crime. Of course, you have to have some grounds for accusing the person, and you have to be acting in good faith. But if you are wrong, you aren't liable for civil damages. Would a warrant have to be procured to search the house for the rifle? No, not if the search was made by the police. 
That was decided in a case I listened in on two months ago over in Crescent City. But of course, you can't go around searching every house in town, Father. Jerry grinned. I know. We've got to be sure it's the right house. Father Tim paused. How well do you know the hardware men here and in Crescent City? Well enough to get them to check their books and see who might have bought a certain item during the past year or two? I know them well enough, Father, for that, anyway. What do you want me to find out? I'd like to know if anyone purchased a telescopic sight for a rifle. For a moment, Jerry looked wide-eyed and open-mouthed at Father Tim. Phew, I see what you mean. I'll get right after it. I'll try Harry's gun shop here, and winter sports shop in Crescent City, too. Yes, do that, Father Tim said quietly. And thanks, Jerry. I'll go tell Mary Jo that I can't take her home in my car. She's not going for a couple of hours anyway. Oh, well, she'll get home. She might even call Bill. He gave Father Tim a grin. He'd be ready and willing, I'm sure. Yeah, I know. So would a lot of other guys. Father Tim was halfway up the stairs to the second floor of the rectory when the doorbell rang. He leaned heavily against the wall and waited. He was tired, more tired than he had realized. All this added worry over Bill, together with the extra work of the festival, was pulling him down. He hoped the call was not for him. The cold draft of air up the stairway felt good. As far as he was concerned, this extremely hot weather could end any time. He heard Miss Kearney's footsteps coming towards the stairway. She knew he was waiting, as she had seen him on her way to answer the door. She gave him a wry smile. You have a visitor in the vestibule, John Patrick O'Rourke. What does he want? I didn't inquire, but from the breathless expectancy, I imagine he's carrying a message to Garcia. Father Tim walked wearily to the vestibule. Hello, Muscles. Hi, Father. If Mr. Santos asked you if I told you he gave me a kick in the pants, you'd tell him I did, but he didn't. What in the world are you talking about? Muscles swallowed. It's like this, Father. I met Lippy Santos. Mr. Santos. Yeah, Mr. Santos. I met him down by the bowling alley, and he said I was a stoolie for you, and I was scared because you know what that means. I'm afraid I don't, Muscles. What's a stoolie? A stool pigeon, an informer. They're in the comics. When guys like Mr. Santos or Big Dutch or Rocky find out about them, it's pretty awful. You'll tell him when you see him. I'm no stoolie, won't you? Those guys don't mess, Father. Father Tim smiled reassuringly. I'm sure they don't. So I'll tell Mr. Santos you are not an informer. Now what was all this about a kick? Muscle scratched the bumpy curve of his skull behind his ears. I don't get it either, Father, but he said to tell you that he had kicked me in the pants. But he didn't, honest. Father Tim pushed his lower lip out, but his eyes were smiling. I think he meant that he had told you something for your own good. That's it, Father, he did. He said when I'm big, if I want to play cards with a pal, that would be okay. But if my pal has a friend from Pittsburgh, that I don't know, for me not to play with him because a friend might be a teacher, and I'd lose all my money. He said it was adult education. I see Mr. Santos is a humorist. Didn't sound funny to me. I suppose not. It might if you were older. Old people sure crack corny jokes. No laughs in him. Muscles wrinkled his nose. Then he said my pal would call up and ask if I wanted a chance to win my money back, and when I said I did, he'd say he had another friend a teacher from Detroit, and I'd lose my money again. He said never to gamble with strangers. Father Tim's face became grim, and he stared out across the front lawn. So there it was, the thing he wanted to know, the thing Joel Santos had refused to answer when he had questioned him. The picture of what had happened was clear, and he knew now why murder had been committed. The poor, miserable, misguided man. Money the root of much evil, had caused him to commit murder. God have mercy on his soul. He looked down at Muscles. What Mr. Santos told you was good advice, if you must gamble. But my advice is, never start gambling. For a full five minutes, worked up over what he had just learned, Father Tim lectured Muscles on the evils of gambling and what it might lead to.
It was nearly seven o'clock that evening when Jerry Laughlin phoned Father Tim. I didn't get around to all the stores, Father, but I got a partial list of names and types of telescopic sites. If you want them, I'll be glad to bring the list over to you. I'd like to see it very much, Jerry. Okay. You'll be surprised at one name on the list, Father. Really surprised. I don't think I will, Jerry. I might have been early this afternoon, but not now. Father Tim paused. But bring the list over. I'd like to see what kind of telescopic sight he used. He sat motionless for several long minutes after the phone call. There was no doubt in his mind now about the murderer of Samuel Blake and the assailant of John Linton. He must present the facts to Father Kearney and get his advice. But he must present them in an orderly fashion, or Father Kearney would become impatient. He walked slowly to the front hall and up the stairs. He'd sit in his room and think it all through first so that he would have it clear in his mind in order to be able to answer Father's questions. A soft breeze was moving the ruffled curtains at the north window as he entered his room. It seemed a bit cooler. Perhaps the long, hot spell was to be broken. He moved the curtains aside and looked out across the rooftops in the valley below and out across the rolling hills to the west. He was tired. His mind, although not so confused now with the jumble of thoughts, was restless. He had much to do to plan for the activities of the fall, the youth clubs of which he was director, the opening of school, the beginning of the parish census, and his football team. He'd been taking too much time lately from his parish duties. He'd have to forget everything but his own work. Picking up his bravery, he walked slowly down the three flights of steps. He would go over to the church to kneel in the sanctuary and read his office, and say a prayer of thanks. He had much for which to be thankful. End of chapter 16「Seventeen of Roman Color Detective by Grace and Harold Johnson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Seventeen. At a quarter after nine the following Monday morning, August eighteenth, Bill phoned his brother. Tim, I just got a call from the county prosecutor, and he'd like us to be over at the courthouse at ten thirty. He's going to hold a preliminary hearing. You go, Bill. I've got work to do. I have a football team to coach. Remember? You were to be here, too. There's already two dozen boys out on the field. Tell the kids to come back tomorrow. This hearing's important. So is this football practice, and I wouldn't disappoint them. This is my job, Bill. I've got to take care of it. I've been neglecting my duties too much this past week as it is. Did Mr. Tabor say whether or not he had the ballistic report yet? I'm eager to know if the shell muscles found came from the same rifle that Benteen found when he searched the house. Yes, Tabor said Benteen drove to Cleveland and had the test made there. It's the same rifle, all right. Well, you go ahead to the hearing. I'll coach the team. The kids will be disappointed that you aren't here, but I'll tell them you'll be around tomorrow. Okay? Or how about late this afternoon, about four o'clock? You'll surely be back by then. We'll get started with practice this morning, and then have another one when you get here this afternoon. The kids will love that. Two practices in one day. Is that all right with you? Sure. Go ahead and tell them. This hearing won't last all day. See you then, Tim. Bye, Bill. Father Tim got up from his desk, went to his room, and slipped into an old pair of trousers, old shoes, and a t-shirt. He was now the coach of St. Mary's football team. The clock in the courthouse dome pointed to twenty minutes after ten when Bill parked his car on Main Street and dropped a nickel into the parking meter. He had ten minutes before it was time to sit in on a hearing for a crime, which six days ago the sheriff and prosecutor had been trying to pin on him. It would be a queer experience, this hearing. When he entered the prosecutor's office, Jerry Laughlin was lounging across the rail around the receptionist's desk, talking to her. After they had shaken hands, Jerry said, Tabor will be right out. He's holding the hearing upstairs in the law library. More room there than in his office. Let's go up. The library on the second floor was not much larger than Tabor's office. Bill wondered why he had bothered to make the change. The room smelled dry and dusty. The two large windows at the end needed washing, and the high ceiling of patterned square metal needed paint. Two sides of the room were lined from floor to ceiling with leather-bound law books. At the far end, near the windows, was a heavy golden oak table, its top scarred by many cigarette burns. 
Jerry walked around the table and threw open both windows. Stuffy in here. Sure is. Wait till Tabor gets going on the guy. It'll be still hotter. Within a few minutes, the prosecutor entered, dapper and smiling, carrying a thirty thirty Winchester rifle with a telescopic sight attached to it. He shook hands with Bill. We'll get started in a few minutes. The sheriff's bringing him over right now. How about you and Laughlin sitting over there along that side? He pointed to the stack of books against the north wall. Tabor then pushed a chair over near the doorway and another facing the table, across from the large armchair which he would occupy. The clock in the dome boomed out the half hour. Tabor busied himself with some papers at the table, while Jerry and Bill sat silent, waiting. Through the open window, Bill watched the sun play on the branches of a maple tree. He could see the leaves moving gently in a light breeze. A squirrel, leaping from branch to branch, held him fascinated for a moment until it disappeared with a final leap into the dense foliage of the treetop. The sound of footsteps pounding on the marble floor of the corridor came in through the open doorway. The silence of the room, which had been mere emptiness, now became weighty oppression. With one accord, the eyes of the three men went to the doorway, through which Sheriff Pentine was leading his prisoner, Frank Stone. There was an uncomfortable tension when Stone, his eyes averted from Bill, walked into the room and took the chair across the table from the prosecutor. Ben dropped into the chair beside the doorway, and after a grin and nod at Jerry and Bill, leaned back hard against the seat, his hands clasped behind his neck. He looked smug and satisfied. It didn't make any difference to Benteen who the prisoner was, just so he had apprehended him, Bill thought as he watched his actions. The palms of his hands became moist as he pondered on how close he had been to playing the role of the accused at this preliminary hearing. Thanks to Tim and his mental alertness, he was now a free man. A court stenographer, a middle-aged man, thin and bored-looking, came in, closed the door, and took a seat at the end of the table. He laid out three sharpened pencils, opened his notebook, and looked at the prosecutor. Then Tabor leaned across the table, cleared his throat, and looked straight at Frank Stone. You understand, Mr. Stone, this is merely a preliminary hearing and an attempt to clarify the various points that have come up in this case. Stone nodded. You'll have to answer all questions by yes or no, unless you wish to qualify or enlarge on them. Stone said, I understand. They went rapidly through the early routine questions. Once during that period, Stone glanced sidewise, bloodshot, sleepless eyes, at Bill. Tabor was at his best. His questions began to jump from the present to the past and back again, as if to keep Stone off balance. The prosecutor was a different man from the one who had interviewed Bill. He stung Stone with his waspiness. Suddenly he pointed to the rifle on the table. Does this rifle belong to you, Mr. Stone? Bill heard Stone catch his breath. He leaned forward. I didn't hear you. The prosecutor repeated the question. No, sir. Stone replied. Tabor looked at Sheriff Benteen. Will you come forward, Sheriff, and identify this weapon? Benteen walked up importantly, picked up the rifle, and looked at it. Is that the rifle you found in Mr. Stone's home? Yes, sir. It's the same rifle. Deputy Reynolds and I found it, wrapped up in a piece of cloth in Stone's attic behind a trunk. That's all, Sheriff. Benteen took his seat by the door again, stretched out his legs, and folded his hands across his stomach. Tabor again turned his attention to Stone. Did you ever own this telescopic sight? No. Did you ever own a telescopic sight for a rifle? Stone removed his spectacles and pinched his nose, as though thinking before he answered. No. Suddenly Bill saw the flash of white under the iris of his eyes as Stone realized what he had said. A look of guilt swept across his face. With an effort, he sought to gain control of himself, to explain away his last answer. Slowly, he put on his spectacles. I bought one once, but I don't think it was one like that. I bought it for a twenty-two target rifle I owned. I sold it, rifle and all, since. To whom did you sell it? I don't recall his name. Young fellow around town. Is it important? No, not at all. We know that on August 4th you bought this telescopic sight at Winter Sports Shop. Stone struggled for control. If you say that rifle and sight belong to me, 
My fingerprints would be all over them, are they? No, Mr. Stone, there aren't any prints on the rifle. It had been wiped clean. It's just like I thought, Mr. Tabor. Someone planted that rifle in my home. He paused and looked at the prosecutor, as if judging how he would receive what he was going to say next. And I think you know who that somebody is, so why keep on questioning me? Tabor made a reply, but only let his dead set eyes show his expression of disgust. I said there were none of your prints on the rifle, but they are on the underside of the mounting for the telescopic sight. You failed to remove the sight and wipe under there, Mr. Stone. Stone goggled his bloodshot eyes at Tabor. All right, so it is my rifle. I made a mistake in not saying it was, because I was afraid, just like I was afraid after the thirty thirty shell was found. I knew that if you found out I owned that rifle, you'd do your best to pin the crime on me, just like you were doing. That's why I wiped the fingerprints off the rifle. I was afraid. Who wouldn't be? Tabor then presented the enlarged photograph of the head of a test cartridge case and the head of the cartridge case found by Muscles. For your information, the firing pin depression made in a shell is rarely exactly in the center. Note how the depression in both of these is slightly off-center, but exactly alike. What's more, the cartridge case we found out where Linton was shot had line impressions exactly the same as on the test cartridge case. The breech block in every rifle will make its own distinctive pattern. Stone began twisting his lower lip between his forefinger and thumb. Against the solidity of Tabor's mind and character, he had no chance. Outside the courthouse bell struck eleven times. For a moment a strange cloak of dignity fell over Stone. Then he broke and confessed. From there on, Prosecutor Tabor reminded Bill of a chameleon. His mood changed with the flow of the eventful questioning. He smiled, he frowned, and at times he showed anger. He was gentle, witty, charitable, indomitable. He chose the mood and tone of voice which suited each individual occasion. And so the sordid story came out. For over two years, Tedford Wilson, Stone, and usually some out-of-town friend of Wilson's, had played poker. Stone's losses had been so great that he finally put up his stock in the news as collateral for loans from the bank, where Wilson was president. When Bill explained how they knew that the friends Wilson brought with him were card sharks procured for him by Libby Santos, Stone filled the small room with the curses he called down on Wilson. Stone said he could now see it all, how Wilson had deliberately gone out to make him lose money, so that Wilson, in the role of friend, could help him retrieve his losses. He told how Wilson had cut him in on a seventy-thirty basis on the farm options picked up for the site of the dam in Galton. Wilson to get the seventy per cent. In return for this, Stone was to do everything possible to get John Linton to give up his attack on the local site. When Stone saw that Linton would not change his mind about the dam and continued to print editorials in favor of the Hart's Corner site to arouse the public, he became frantic. He saw himself, a man without money, financially ruined, bankrupt. He couldn't stand the thought of telling his wife, accustomed to ease and comfort, that he had lost everything gambling. There was nothing to do but to kill John Linton, and then he, as majority stockholder, could set the news policy. That was when he went to Winter's sports shop and bought a telescopic sight. He had hoped to kill Linton during one of his frequent walks along the river. Then, with the festival coming on, Linton hadn't taken those walks, so he had to do it another way. Blake's murder was a mistake. He had thought it was Linton sitting in the room reading. His second attempt had been the night he slugged Jerry. He looked at Prosecutor Tabor, his face expressionless, his voice normal. That's the way it was. There was no need for him to say any more, so Tabor left it there in silence. However, it gave Bill Devon a curious twinge of something that was almost anger. He looked at Stone, his eyes hard and full of puzzled curiosity. Why did you try to pin this murder on me? The small perpendicular lines above Stone's nose grew deeper. I really intended to leave the pistol on the terrace without fingerprints. I wore gloves, you know. I didn't want to be caught with it in my possession, and I knew no one could trace the gun to where I got it. I bought it from a G.I. down in Cincinnati, after the war. He didn't know me. I didn't know him. We just happened to meet. But I did bring a revolver with me, in case I met someone and had to use it in getting away. Then I saw you, and got the idea to use your prints. 
I knew you'd eventually get out of it, but I figured it would confuse the sheriff so long that the case might be dropped, unsolved. Tabor looked at his wristwatch. That's it, I think. Jerry and Bill got up and started to leave. Benteen stepped forward, and his hand bit into Bill's shoulder in a gesture of good fellowship. Well, it looks like you're all out of this. Yes, and without an assist from you. Now don't say that, Captain. I found the rifle. That's right, you did, after you were told where to look for it. But thanks just the same. Benteen watched him walk out of the room, shook his head. Some guys sure are hard to please. Then he stepped over to Frank Stone, jerked his head back. Come on, let's get going. Outside on the steps leading up to the courthouse, Jerry stopped. Let's stand here a minute in the shade. I've got a couple questions that need answering. Did Father Tim tell you how he got onto Stone in the first place? Bill nodded. When we were in Linton's hallway right after Blake was shot, Wilson and Stone came in on a sightseeing tour. Considering he saw that he had killed the wrong man, Stone sure bore up well. But when he was talking to Tim, he said he was going home and get himself a stiff drink. Tim thought he smelled wine on him. Then the other night when I was in the rectory, I smelled something and asked him what it was. He said it was DDT. I recalled then that I had smelled the same thing on the guy who'd held me up. Tim remembered that it was the same odor he had mistaken for wine. Ergo, stone. And from just that? Oh, no, Bill cut in. You told Tim that you had mentioned to Stone how Benteen was going to arrest me within 48 hours. That time was nearly up, and it hurried him into taking another shot at Linton. He wanted to kill him while I was still loose, so I would be the suspect. I sure played it into his hands. The guy had luck, but not enough of it. Tim figured if it was Stone who shot Linton with a rifle, he must have used a telescopic sight because of his weak eyes. So he had you look into that, and you found Stone had bought one not long ago. That really put the clincher on it. The muscles found out how Santos was getting card sharks to trim Stone. I suppose Wilson and the sharks split the plunder. The rest you know. The finding of the shell, my swearing out the warrant for Stone's arrest, the finding of the rifle in his home. I'm sure you're lucky to have a brother as smart as Tim. You can say that again, Jerry said. Well, I've got to get moving. I've still got to get back to the office, write this up, and get over to Mary Joe's by 2.30. We're driving up to Cleveland this afternoon. Bill gave Jerry one of his good-natured smiles. If I was going to stay around here, I'd give you a run for your money there, Jerry. Mary Joe's a grand girl. I could go for her. You and a lot of other guys. But I don't give the opposition a chance. I keep her dated up all the time. That's one reason I came back from my fishing trip up north. Sure, it was raining and the fish weren't biting, but also I got to thinking. Someone might be rushing Mary Jo. So back I came. How long you staying on here, Bill? A couple more days, if I don't get involved in another murder. The civilian life is too rugged for me. I'll be the happiest guy in the USA when this leg gets okay again, so I can pass the physical to stay in the army. Civilian life isn't so tough. You just hit a bad break. Maybe, Bill started toward his car. I'll be seeing you before I leave. That's for sure, Bill. So long. So long, Jerry. As the noon hour approached, the sun beat down with glittering rays on the playing field of St. Mary's. Joe and Malone kicked a high spiraling punt which came down straight for Father Tim's head as he stood talking to Freddie Burke. Look out, Father! Muscles yelled. Father Tim looked up, blinded by the sun, and jumped to one side. He threw up his hands to protect his head, and the ball hit them and stuck. It was probably the most spectacular catch ever made on St. Mary's Field. Did you see that? Muscles yelled. Pride filled him, pride in his coach. Boy, did you see that? No team anywhere had a coach who could do that, Muscles thought. No, sir. If Father Tim had gone to Notre Dame, he'd have been the big star on the team. End of Chapter 17 End of Roman College Detective by Grace and Harold Johnson